Hey, this is Matt from that time we woke up in a podcast and had to explain manga. Our heated adventures over analyzing manga we find interesting, otherwise known as the Over Manga Cast. And it's that time of year. The sun's hot, the dogs are sizzling, and the 4th of July is right around the corner. So we're celebrating the only way we know how, with political intrigue and so much melodrama. Ah, we're back with a vengeance for Eagle, The Making of an Asian American President, Volume 2. Written and illustrated by Kaiji Kawaguchi. Let freedom ring and enjoy the episode. Hello everyone and welcome once again to the Over Manga Cast. My name is Sam and as always here at the top of the episode, we like to talk about our familiarity with the franchise that we've read. Although considering the gimmick nature of this episode, I, I, I don't you can just go listen to the last one. We're doing Eagle again, because it's the 4th of July again. Happy freedom. 4th of July, everybody. I mean, freedom ring. There's something on the surface of things. Yeah. Good old America Day. Begin Operation 1776. Uh, but yes, uh, I have not had any further experience with uh, Eagle, the making of an Asian American president, since uh, the previous 4th. Uh, has, has anybody had anything different? Uh, Unfortunately, I haven't. I mean, I wish I had, but as we know, you can only break the locks of freedom that keep Eagle at the making of an Asian American contained within itself <laughs> to be released only on the holiest of days, which is, of course, the 4th of July. Absolutely. Amen. I'll, I'll, I'll steal that excuse. I haven't read any further either until <laughs> now. And how about you, Jay? <laughs> uh, unfortunately not. Yeah, uh, so th this was... Uh... Okay, I gotta say this. This was a fun one to start reading again, if only because I have gotten so used to being in uh, reading for the podcast brain, so I start, you know, doing the manga reading of right to left. That is not how this manga works, I forgot. <laughs> this is this is an older series, uh, yep. part of the Viz Select, so they did reverse it. Actually, actually, mm -hmm. I should have checked. Maybe this was actually written. Oh, it doesn't make any sense. They did I... reverse it. I'm not sure if on um, you typically shouldn't but mm -hmm. i i think that the the mangaka might be enough of an america boo that it was done left to right you know what that makes sense because there's a lot of english text in this mm -hmm. mm. which was most likely not done by a letterer just a part of the just a part of the panel itself but uh we start off uh our return to the uh, presidential race of this was 2000, right? Yes. Yeah, two th yeah 2000. God, <laughs> 22 years ago, our time. So old. In the presidential race of 2000, uh, uh, intrepid reporter Takashi Joe is uh, continuing his examination into uh, the life of one Kenneth Yamaoka, senator of the United States and uh, presidential uh, wannabe. And as we found out in the last reading, potentially his father. Yes, potentially his father. It's who, heavily implied. They mm. outright confirm it, but then don't. They confirm it in such a way that there are so many ways that it could get wiggled out from you don't know whether or not that... Uh... Well, it, it was a confession by a politician, so it was said in such a way that it could never be used against him because I didn't say that outright. Mm. Why would you assume that? All I said was that a child should know his father. That's literally all I said. You're implying everything else, Takashi. You're crazy. I didn't say that. But uh, Takashi needs to find out what else is going on with the, the Yamaoka family. So uh, he takes a taxi to Brooklyn, where he is hoping to gain more information about the enigmatic Yamaoka by interviewing his sister. Uh, who, who apparently married Fox McCloud. <laughs> yeah, uh she's uh Elizabeth McLeod ni Yamaoka and uh she has she has a bit of a horror mo panel moment <laughs> when Takashi and when she answers the door sees Takashi there and there's a whole panel of her standing there sweating against a, a warped background and she's like, Oh god, it's Kenneth <laughs> Or at least that's all we can assume from her expression. It's hilarious. Because Joe does not look like his father at all. Not much. It, it carries well, a lot of, like, well, we'll get into this, like, definitely there's some racial stereotypes and some racial bias that's oh, blatantly oh, explored Eagle, here. Eagle, the making of an Asian American president, has some racial biases in it? <laughs> I was trying to be nice. It's not just bias. 
is what I'm trying to say. It's not just bias. He he is a male character in this manga, which means his jaw is incredibly square. Yeah, I w- actually, that's what I was going to mention. <laughs> As previously noted last time, this has a very, like, classic American comic book art style, and the faces will blend together sometimes for particularly the male characters. Uh, God help the two blonde men in this. They look identical, oh. but have very different... I was so confused until and- they had a meeting with each other. And they're both on the antagonist side. It's like... It it would at least be somewhat helpful if they were on different uh, political campaigns, but no, it's uh, Noah and it's one Noah of his and dudes. one of his staffers. Yeah, well, one of them wears a turtleneck, and it's not Noah. So <laughs> you're right. It's you're, talk. Well, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there, there there's a particular way that some people will have their bangs that is literally their only identifying feature <laughs> relative to every other male character in the story uh <laughs> there's a reason why comics have evolved beyond this art style but okay yeah it works for, this, uh, uh, the art style works so well for this it's though. very much it yeah does. no it's very much it's very much done on purpose for tonal reasons <laughs> i just love during uh, while they're getting the interview started there's a a picture of uh it's a family photo of yamoka's father and him as a young boy and his older brother it it could just as easily be a time lapse of three different versions of kenneth yamoka it doesn't help that uh kenneth is wearing basically conan edagawa's outfit like (laughs) (laughs) he is he's off to he's off to solve mysteries but anyway, uh, uh, we, we get a little bit of flashback as uh, Elizabeth goes on what uh, Kenneth was like in his boyhood as uh, we find out they loved playing football because they're Americans and football. They're good old Americans. Yes, uh, Ken and his older brother, Joseph, who uh, Ken looked up to as a uh, as a role model figure and instilled in him a love of sport and a uh, strong determination. And seemingly regularly beamed him in the face with the football. Character. Building character. <laughs> we have to create physical damages so we can tell each other apart. <laughs> <laughs> That's rude. You know, I think Sugimoto from Golden Kamui had a point. <laughs> but uh, as as we find out with uh, every flashback, um, Things are not happy because we uh, we don't see his brother because uh, he got drafted into the Vietnam War. And apparently the entire community came out to uh, see him off. It was, uh, it was a real uh, shindig as basically the entirety of Seattle's Japanese American community arrived to uh, see him off to war. Completely believable, actually. Yeah, yeah very, I very, very tight knit community. A local young man of prominence. And I mean, like this, this is once again, the exact same, the exact same paradigm that we've seen every other time. Here's this like legitimately plausible, but like absolutely perfect, you know, story mm-hmm. that it, that seems purpose built to completely picturesque uh, to, to set up Yamaoka's image. You know, it, 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 it's really hard to tell, like how much, how much is, uh, Elizabeth McLeod in setting up setting up her brother for uh, the image, you know, because I mean, like, uh, on the one hand, it really does kind of feel like this is coming from at least a relatively genuine place. I mean, she's like two steps removed from the campaign, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, she's not like doing anything for the campaign. The only reason why Joe is even acknowledging that she is Yamaoka's sister is because, you know, he's so tied in with family drama with Yamaoka in specific, uh, we get no other indication that she's involved in any way. But at the same time, it's the exact same, like, he's sparkly hoping... perfect version of him. <laughs> he's hoping for an unbiased perspective, and uh, that is not what he is getting, ultimately. Well, especially not about Jonathan. Hmm. Mm. Considering, as we find out, like, immediately after he goes to Vietnam, we cut to his funeral. Uh, he didn't do well over there. Press F in the chat, boys. Yep, F's in the chat. Kenneth, uh, this was a, uh, a sea change uh, for him, as we see. He becomes uh, dedicated to the idea of uh, going to Vietnam himself to find out uh, 
what it was that was worth the life of his beloved older brother. Yeah, and and I gotta tell you, the one of the things I couldn't help but notice about this is um, I, I was very particular in the way I phrased it. Uh, it's hard to tell how much of the like layers of image are being put on this because it shows Yamaoka being, you know, like a, a hot-blooded young man and and not exactly all perfect and pristine. Yeah. He's he's arguing with his parents and saying some really nasty things. That's what I was going to say when you were like saying I'm not sure how pristine the story is. I think she's uh also I misspoke earlier. Uh, his brother's name is Joseph. I think Elizabeth mm -hmm. is talking very highly of the brother who died and she didn't yeah, know anymore. Yeah. She lost at a young age. Uh, Kenneth, she portrays him, I think, very accurately because he, like, is very angry and constantly having outbursts. And, like, it's not, like, every other time you see him, he's so calm, reserved. He has, like, an entire monologue pre-prepared for anything that comes up. This is just very emotional. Like, mm -hmm. why aren't we talking about his medals? And we're like, Kenneth, what? We're having dinner in silence because we just lost, like, our family member. And you're like, why aren't we talking about his medals? I get mm. what you're going for, but geez, what a weird way to go about it's it. But like very like, and I've said similar about previous episodes, but it's just like, it's very tone deaf of like, people grieve in different ways. And mm. maybe they don't want to talk about his medals because they're not personally there yet. I don't think the manga is trying to make a statement on this is the correct way to handle this. Like uh, Kenneth is freaking out and uh, his mother tries for uh, Joseph died with honor for his country. Slams table. That's a lie. We all felt the same way, but none of us had the balls to say it like Kenneth did. <gasps> <laughs> there is the sense of like this. This feels less filtered, but I mean, like the entire the entire thing up to this point has been how much of this is manufacture how much of this is for the drama and how much like i i mean if your statement is i don't think we can trust flashbacks because they're melodramatic uh, my counterpoint is the things in real life are also melodramatic. <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that's yeah a clue that this is a lie we're being told well no no it uh i i feel like the dinner scene in particular is very unfiltered I, it's just there's a lot of stuff around it that is you know, built into that narrative. Um, there are cause... characters I'm not willing to believe. Elizabeth, I am. Yeah, Elizabeth is the most trustworthy flashbacker so far. But Absolutely. anyway, um, as as established, uh, Kenneth is being a um, edgy little teen who's going through his final years at high school. And then we cut to his graduation day with a crack of thunder in the air as he has his birthday. I mean, graduation cake. <laughs> it's literally just a happy birthday cake that says happy graduation i'm like oh okay <laughs> yeah, you know you go with what you got father i am 18 now i am signing up for the military i want to know what joseph felt i love the way this is done because uh he's like i'm enlisting in the marines you can't stop me i already sent in my papers <laughs> you wanted my feedback or didn't you the dad wasn't keen on Joseph going because he's just like, hey, y you can just go to more college. Like, we're well off. I'll just keep paying. And you can, if you're in school, you can't be drafted. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. It's good for you. He's like, no, I want to serve my country. He's like, uh, fine. And now that Kenneth's doing the same thing, he's like, your brother died. They're not, we lost a son already. They're not going to draft another one. Like, have you seen Saving Private Ryan? It's about this. I don't know if this movie is <laughs> coming out. Have you seen this movie that was not in production? Yes. It might have been in production in 1960. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. Someone they was... wouldn't draft me. That's why I'm volunteering. You are the smartest tack in this box, aren't you? <laughs> but like, key linchpin of this is Kenneth's, this isn't like he feels really strongly about his country. He doesn't even feel really strongly about the war. He feels really strongly about the person he idolized going off to do this. He wanted to know what that person believed in. Yes, mm -hmm. it's like really gives me, um, well, obviously headstrong teenager vibes where it's just like, I don't know, but I have strong emotions and I'm just going to go with that and find mm -hmm. out where it takes me. Well, that's kind of the thing. He doesn't have the strong emotions. He has, I don't know why. He has a curiosity that well, is that's motivating a, this. Well, that's a strong motivation. Yeah. Like uh, a strong emotion of like, is, I is, want is to curiosity know. an emotion? I don't know. In a sense. I think the strong emotion comes from his frustration of not knowing. 
and the curiosity feeds into that. So uh, he does receive one bit of support from Elizabeth, is who also wants to know what it is that Joseph uh, fought and died for. It, during the conversation with their parents, she says that uh, she supports him, and when they leave and he thanks her, she's like, I don't actually support you. I think you're an idiot, and I don't want you to do this, but I know talking, trying to talk you out of it isn't going to work, so... <laughs> Hey, I appreciate that sister energy. She's like, I don't support you, but I also know you're too, like, freaking hard-headed that I can't convince you otherwise, so I'm gonna do whatever you want, little brother. I, Be I an don't idiot. Su <laughs> I don't support you, but I'm willing to get your back against mom and dad just to keep the family together. Because mm -hmm. what I you were going to do is say, screw them and head off on your own, which would shatter things even further. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want you to become a killer. If you go over there, that's going to happen, but... Just so that we're clear. <laughs> mm -hmm. Also, I don't know if I'm just noting this because of, uh, like, recent talks with Brandon and in general, but, like, the lettering in this is really good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, when they're the having, like, their great. screaming matches, how it switches, and then they've got the occasional bubble letters to, like, really emphasize points. It's just cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really well done. It, it, it's one of those ones where it's uh like because of the classic style it doesn't it doesn't feel as like big and intrusive as it could have otherwise because that's something that was uh it feels very superman -like. yeah yeah it, mm. yeah it, it's it, part of the aesthetic it fits in yeah it fits in really well well anyway uh yep but I hear about kenneth getting injured and elizabeth flies over there yeah she flies to the philippines because he he might be they're they're calling her over because she he might be dying. So they're flying mm -hmm. out next of kin. Yeah. And she's just like, Well, I knew this would happen. You're such an idiot, but geez, you promised you wouldn't die. Mm-hmm. The scene that has the most uh artifice to it, and the reason why I'm not the reason why I hesitate to completely trust Elizabeth is you get the uh uh, uh, he's probably never gonna wake up, and then his eyes open, and he takes his sister's hand to assure her that he will survive. <laughs> like the doctors told me, it was because he was such a good athlete that he was able to survive. But I think it was for something else that he loved this country too much. I'm going to be president. <laughs> I, I, can I just say yet again, I love the the narrative of this entire series. It's just delicious. <laughs> oh, it is. It is delicious. It, it turns the presidential election into a shonen battle manga, and I love it. Like <laughs> it is, it is the tastiest ham I've had since Easter. Yes. <laughs> we get uh, perhaps my favorite of the of the chapter headers after uh, Takashi leaves the interview with Elizabeth. Uh, now burning for the need to uh, see Kenneth and. Uh, confront him with this new information uh we get a night in manhattan <laughs> i don't know why but i love that uh title page of the shot of the of the empire state building and uh to cut, uh being flanked by uh joe and yamaoka it's great i love how yamaoka's head is literally twice the size of joe's <laughs> like <laughs> it's that american spirit or oh, you weren't grown up on corn and football <laughs> <laughs> Wait, his head is bigger, is or is that American ego? I don't know. <laughs> There's a metaphor in here somewhere. But uh, mm -hmm. we we cut to Senator Yamamoto, who is uh, at the end of his campaigning in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, his campaign manager is basically going like, "Hey, you're in New York. This is literally the last time you're gonna get a full night's sleep for weeks because we're in the middle of basically Super Tuesday, but for the primaries." You are going to order room service, you are going to go to bed early, and you are going to get a good night's rest. And he's just like, yep, will do. Yes, Daddy. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Joe hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> then well, Joe yeah, because then, then Joe shows up. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, your boy Arthur. <laughs> I love this guy. All he's... the side characters in this are great. Arthur's up there, though. <laughs> It's bedtime for Kenneth. It'll wait. You can wait until tomorrow. He turns away from the door only for Yamaoka to open the door behind him. <laughs> yeah, he was very obviously just waiting for him to leave. Yeah, I wasn't going to sleep anyway. So let's go get dinner. <laughs> In New York, you live your dreams, so you don't need to sleep. What? <laughs> okay, that sounds like something that someone from NYC would say. 
I don't that. see much point in sleep. <laughs> then again, I don't see much point in eating either. But yeah, because I, I are think... going to dinner. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I suspect you had a hard time emotionally resonating with this chapter, Jacob. But. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, they go to a seafood restaurant. One of my favorite what? lines is um, Yamaoka going to Joe, hey, do you like fish? Yes. No, no I hate it. I hate it. No, I have a I... miserable time on this island. It's awful. I am the only Japanese person who doesn't like fish. Like... <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I'm pretty sure there are a significant population who do not care for fish. I'm pretty I sure. imagine that has to be significantly smaller than the average American who doesn't like fish. Yes, though. Just... but I'm just saying I'm prob I wouldn't scoff at it, not like say it doesn't exist. I'm pretty sure it does exist. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have more uh, beautiful American city skylines. Can we talk about my favorite like side thing of this manga? Every time mm -hmm. they're in a room, that room is barren and four times larger than it needs to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Their private dining room is in, like, basically a ballroom <laughs> that has been emptied out but for the table by the window. It's so... it, it It's way too big. I, I keep thinking I'm going to look out, you know, we're going to see a panel that shows the rest of the room and there'll be, like, more tables, even if they're not filled. And nope, nope, it's just a giant-ass room. Because it's, <laughs> it's a private dining room in this restaurant. Joe has brought his manuscript on uh, the story he's been working on. Yes. Because he, he currently wants daddy's approval. <laughs> we get one of those uh, amazing lines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? What? Hold on. I got it right here. As he's reading it, he gets to the end. And he's just like, well, this is a story. Might even have mass appeal. But Americans aren't so gullible. They never let such a nice man become president. And this American isn't that man. And I'm just like, ooh, <laughs> on point. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I look at that panel and I want to refute it, but... <laughs> it's true. Just the way you phrased it is hilarious. <laughs> it feels wrong and vaguely insulting, but it's correct. <laughs> I can't tell if it's satire. <laughs> yeah, it's the it, 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 it's that classic eagle flare. Is this satire? Is this genuine? Is this satire? Is this a translation difference? Is this a cultural gap that's being missed, or uh, somewhere mm -hmm. in between? Yes, probably that. Probably D. <laughs> probably D. Yeah, but uh, Joe is not taking this uh, rejection well. As Kenneth continues to calmly eat the scallops and tear apart more and more of his entire work he's <laughs> so ferociously aggressive like it seems like he wants to he wants to incite joe to punch him like uh -huh. yes they're like playing this weird game because the senator knows what joe is after very obviously so and it's he kind of plays into that of just like this whole back and forth of like I'm not saying I'm your father, but I totally am not going to deny it. But at the same time, I want to spend more time with you. At the same time, I'm just like, you're in over your head, kids. Just leave it alone and just like enjoy your time with the campaign. But also, and it's just an interesting dynamic to watch evolve, especially as we progress later on into the reading. It was really interesting mm -hmm. how that continues oh. to be a continuing theme. I guess this this doesn't get brought up again in our reading and we kind of actually don't pick up on this plot line again it little spoilers this volume is a lot of setting up story which fair it's the mm. second volume of story it should be setting up things after you've hooked people with the first volume but yeah. like this conversation in particular and how he continues to goad Joe on I'm kind of wondering if like Kenneth's plan for Joe is to feed him just enough dirt so that eventually when his op-ed comes out, it's supposed to be like this big scandalous thing that because he's been working with Joe this entire time, it's something he can immediately dissuade so mm -hmm. that like he can control the narrative about what the negative press about him is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would explain why he's just like, hey, this is a nice puff piece you've written. No one wants that because that's not what I want. I want something that shows me as kind of a bastard so that I can play against that. 
-hmm. like it would make sense then why he's getting so combative and like why he's also like starting to he insults joe's mom repeatedly in this conversation yeah (laughs) yeah like that that woman from okinawa she must not have been terribly bright if she was into the idea of true love like god damn dude it's so weird because like the conversation he's having here does not match how he's described by literally anybody else Mm -hmm. yeah his art down in a sense around joe and it's like a weird like he, i don't know it's a I weird i don't think he lets his guard down around anyone though is the thing that's why i think this is also an act it's like instead of letting his guard down to become vulnerable he let his guard down so he could swing his sword more effectively i mean even more so to some extent like the the fact that like i don't necessarily trust particularly the ending of elizabeth's uh, little interview but like also as natural as that feels there's a distinct contrast between the parts of her life with yamaoka that i trust because it feels real and natural like it you know is piss and vinegar in his youth and and you know fighting with his parents that feels demonstrably different from the way he is fighting with joe in this moment like mm. he's not doing like he he's cold and calculated and actively cruel which is not something we'd seen of him anywhere else in the entire manga (laughs) like it really does feel it feels purposely out of place especially because how this conversation ends is uh, there's a great panel of him like dabbing his mouth with a napkin as joe's yelling him you're a heartless bastard which is really where my thing of like okay that's the punctuation point he wanted from this conversation which is Mm -hmm. him like cleaning his mouth like i'm done with this conversation that's what i wanted but then he also it's uh, there's a lot of good panels in this argument. This, I, I think we talked about this last time. This uh, mangaka does amazing, like, two people arguing fights. Mm-hmm. But um, this uh, conversation ends with, uh, I have the blood of countless women and children on my hands. Let me tell you about my time in Nam. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, I love that. Yes. His fortunate son plays in the background. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> Cut from Yamaoka, honestly disturbingly calm as he says that, to uh, a younger Yamaoka uh, with his uh, service weapon in the field in the jungles of Vietnam <laughs> on fire in the background. It's uh, so quite the tableau. They're rounding up the Viet Cong. Or maybe just civilians. Yeah. One of the most fraught elements of that conflict was the line between those was very thin. The line between telling the difference between them, yeah. Which is uh, exactly what happens as uh, Kenneth is clearing out a uh, hut and finds a pregnant woman cowering in fear in the side, uh, in the back. And he kind of lowers his weapon and is just like, oh, it's, it's okay. Just come on. We're just rounding up people. Just go along. It'll be fine. And he turns away because people are asking if he'd cleared out. He's like, oh, it's fine. Just, and then there's a tang as a bullet ricochets off his helmet. And he turns to see the woman is now holding a pistol, realizing she misfired to him. Not misfired. Uh, she... Her weapon jammed. We'll make jokes about how like the character designs, you know, like I, I've mentioned the faces blend together a lot in particular in both episodes. But like, that's not a matter of the art not being good, because I love the detail of you can actually see the shell casing that's uh, that's stopped up the uh, the slide on the pistol she has. And as she's like frantically trying to clear her gun, Kenneth goes like, well, fight or flight mode. As It's crazy how suddenly it turns like. Well, his his helmet goes over his eyes, and then basically the tonal shift is from like, mm. oh, lighthearted to nope. <laughs> it it's a whole two page of him firing, and her uh, she doesn't even die for at first because it's a it's a shot in the chest, and she's bleeding out on the ground. He pulls the pin on a grenade, throws it, and walks out. Cool guys don't look at explosions, but it's God. <laughs> And then, like, did you have to do the grenade too? The grenade makes no sense. <laughs> well, I, th- I, I think what the grenade was supposed to be is that they were torching the place, and I think that's supposed to be an incendiary grenade. Uh, and that he was burning the hut down is what I believe w- what that was. But like, you know, obviously, it's, like it's the callousness cold regardless. of it. Yeah, no, the callousness of it is the point. My favorite part is uh, as the hut's burning down, a photo of her and her husband 
floats to the ground. And because of the art style, it looks strangely like Joe and his mom. Hmm. Just because it's uh, it's a very like small photo and it's yeah. got Joe's it haircut. It have a lot of details. Yeah. Yeah. No, again, because it's like the art is great. Character designs are a choice. Well, you want to talk about cool character designs. The next shot of him walking away from the like explosions, a very nice like portrait of his face. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> looking cold and serious. And he says, from that point on, I didn't hesitate to kill the enemy. Still, just this very calm, placid politician smile on his face, you know, open palmed, uh, hands out, very open body language. I understood what the battlefield was all about. When you're awake, all you concentrate on is survival. As he's just talking about... The way he's talking about it, it's like what happened in that very moment was he had a very formative experience, which was, if I show mercy to anyone, they will take advantage of me. Never let that happen and I will be in control. And like... Yeah. Keep people at a distance because they will try and hurt you. Mm -hmm. Well, I also feel like this was very formative, as we already touched upon, was because it was literally a, a woman with child. Like, the yeah, most, no, one of the most vulnerable members of society was who well, let yeah. you down. Well, it, it was literally, like, you can't judge a book by its cover. There is no mm -hmm. bad guys. There is, everyone is potentially an enemy. Which, mm -hmm. which is a very, it, it's a very cynical view of the world. Well, to put it very lightly. It was very principled why they chose a Vietnam vet. Because, you know, there have been other, you know, since um, engagements since Vietnam. But I mean, that's one of the most prominent. But also the overall devastation and just turmoil um, mentally and physically of the war, obviously, is something that has permeated our society and it's been carried over through now multiple generations mm -hmm. of what was experienced and some of the difficult lessons learned. I mean, yes, that is a very serious thing. That's the way they have Kenneth go through it. He's more so using it as a metaphor for politics is equally as cutthroat as war. So, well, cause he, yeah. he also, he also looks Takashi dead in the face I'm still in Vietnam, and now, Takashi, you are too. <laughs> Which, like... So you that talk same freaking smile on his face. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about performance. Oh. Yeah. My favorite, too, is uh, as they're heading out, we get a nice scene of, like, I think it's the Lion King is playing on Broadway. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, they are getting into the cab, and Joe goes like, you know, I'm kind of messed up from that conversation. I'm just going to take a walk to clear my head. And Kenneth's just like, oh, man, as a person just walking by themselves at night, you're probably going to get mugged. Well, good luck with that. And then just leaves. <laughs> and I'm just like, he almost like the, the best part is he almost literally says that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's literally he's lived in. He was a uh, he was a defensive or uh, no, he was. um. He was an attorney at law. He, uh, cause like he did class action suits. Yeah. He, that, that becomes a plot point later. He, he, he worked as an attorney in New York city though, is the, what, where I'm getting at. Yeah. So he yeah. knows what crime is like in the city. And he basically just goes, you're probably going to get mugged. Good luck. And then like, it's like, okay. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, as, uh, Joe, what he is processing the second, like, um, Yamaoka is out of the picture, uh, goes like, he just told me he'd do whatever it takes to win. He feels like anyone who can hurt him is a liability. That's the kind of guy who, if he thought my mother was a threat, would have her killed. Yeah. Yeah, he 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 voices the thing that we had uh, been... Uh, <laughs> we'd all been thinking last time. We'd all been said. suspecting last time. In the horror of this... Uh... He can't take it, so he pukes on the side of the street, which, uh, hey, uh, I think that officially baptizes him as a New Yorker. <laughs> Look, if you what? haven't expelled one kind of bodily fluid in New York, what are we even doing? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad I'm a hermit. Speaking of moments where the artist just killer, Takashi's just agonized face mm -hmm. in these mm -hmm. panels as he, he needs something to believe in. He wants to see Rachel. 
because uh, that's not a that's not also a fraught element of the <laughs> story. Fraud, fraud <laughs> he, element. I I love how they bring up the thing that they didn't bring up last time. Like we joked about how they wrapped it up in a nice, neat little bow last time. Uh, when we get to it, we'll get to it. But they they bring uh, up the problems with that again. <laughs> yep. It's good. It's good to acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. I like the start of the next chapter because uh, I, I love me a good nightmare sequence. And uh, as far as nightmare sequences uh, and dream symbolism go, this one is pretty blunt. But uh, it's Joe uh, moving like through chest deep water in a swamp, pushing aside ferns. And he sees uh, his mother and he tries to get out of the water, but she's shot dead by Yamoka in a soldier's uniform with the... <laughs> That freaking smile. It's going to haunt my dreams now. <laughs> I don't know why. It's so uncanny. I, I think it's the juxtaposition where y Yamoka has that politician's grin on his face as he's discussing just atrocities, uh, horrible things, and then actually performing them, at least in this dream. <laughs> War changes a man. But that was uh, a dream that uh, Takashi was having on the flight to... Uh, they're making their way to Colorado. They're going to Denver for the next part of the campaign trail. We don't join them there uh, straight away. As I should well, join them there. They're, they're away. talking on the plane mm -hmm. about uh, Mayor Gilbert uh, Blackburn, the mayor of New York City. Who That's they're... King Blackburn, because <laughs> they are trying to court him because he is a uh, powerful minority leader, which mm -hmm. would uh, aid. Um, because uh, Yamaoka is doing well with. Um, uh, Asian Americans. He needs all minority groups together behind him to really help hammer in the primaries. Mm -hmm. And and getting New York would be a big deal. He is currently behind in the polls in New York uh, with the primary coming up. But because he had been a uh, he had been a practicing lawyer there for a while, uh, he does have he does have a shot to turn that around. And what is the the first time Blackburn gets mentioned is um, uh, Arthur mentions uh, and you know that he had gotten verbal assurances from Mayor Blackburn that he would indeed support Yamaoka, which would be a big deal for uh, turning New York in his favor against Noah. And we cut to Denver, Colorado. How do you know it's Denver, Colorado? Everyone is wearing winter hats. <laughs> <laughs> They sure are. Although we do get a uh, a nice shot of the Denver International Airport and uh, the Rockies rising majestically in the background. Uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for uh, picturesque mountain shots, so I love this panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yamoke is being greeted by a, uh, a rather impressive coalition of supporters. And uh, but Takashi doesn't care about that. He cares about the fact that uh, Rachel is elsewhere in Colorado. Uh, running around doing the uh, the whole campaign business. So he decides to give her a call like, hey, can I see you? Are you kidding? I'm 200 miles away. Yeah, but like, couldn't I like see you or something? <laughs> no, I'm we only have a week left until Junior Tuesday. I'm super busy. I'll, I'll catch you later. OK, Quick. well, I got a meeting at eight so I can call you after that. Oh, well, OK, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Poor Takashi. He's he's really going through it between the the stuff with Yamaoka and uh, man, I, he, he's I, real hung up on that one kiss. I, I love how he's like, yeah, I'm going to be in a relationship with Rachel, even though I'm currently trying to process my emotions that my dad might have killed my mom. Also, <laughs> my dad might be my girlfriend's dad. <laughs> by marriage, by marriage, <laughs> by marriage, by marriage, no chromo, <laughs> no, no <laughs> chromo. <laughs> Look, here, here's something that that uh, is just a common refrain from me. Japan, if you have to do the sibling thing, at least do it like this. I'm not happy, but if you're good, like, because it <laughs> happens sad. so often, and if you're going to do it. Jacob, the point is the taboo. Confidential. There's I know. <laughs> there's basically no taboo here. It's just like a weird, inconvenient thing to find out. Yes. Uh, Which has its own genre, as we all know. Indeed. <laughs> What a niche genre that is. <laughs> it does exist. Anyway, uh, Takashi is having uh, lunch, dinner, I don't know. He's having a meal with um, 
it's dinner because it ends at eight. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's dinner with his manager from the uh, from the newspaper. I don't who is... think it's his manager. I think it's someone else who is also yeah, no, a foreign it's... reporter. Yeah, no, it, mm. it's the it's because uh, like the the newspaper he works for is big enough that it has a foreign division. And there was somebody who was already in America um mm. and like so it's you know it's a it's a co-worker who works overseas big thing from the scene is uh, this this to me is one of the stronger scenes because uh for all of the uh for all of the familial melodrama with joe and yamaoka like there's the sense of like you know he he gave his word that he wouldn't release any information until the campaign was over and here is one of his uh, coworkers with a uh, word from his boss saying, uh, yeah, but could you just give like a little something? Like you got to have something that, you know, you can. Uh, I, that you I, can love, bitty bitty. I love how this conversation is him like the the coworkers like portrayed real sleazily and just like, yeah, just give me a little bit of dirt. But then like counterpoint, Joe basically decided he's not going to do the assignment he was given. <laughs> And uh -huh. it's just like, I've instead decided to do a two-year research project that I can maybe return something on. Like, he just decided that. <laughs> so, like, yeah. his, his co-worker isn't in the wrong here. He's just like, you know you don't work for him, right? You, yeah. You, you <laughs> don't have to do his PR. He kind of just got a free PR guy. <laughs> well, he doesn't say it that calmly. He slams his fist on the table and screams, Are you working for his campaign or for the company? Which draws the uh, concerned glances of other patrons. <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, and I mean, like, it, 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 it's not so simple either way, because, like, Yamaoka did specifically call Tagashi Joe in particular from that newspaper to do this. So it's not like they didn't know that that was, like, the overall thing. And then he made a verbal agreement afterward with Yamaoka that the way he gets full access to everything is that he won't release anything. But at the same time, like the guy says, who are you working for? Like, I can, I can totally understand why uh, Joe is, is hesitating apropos of none of the family drama associated with it, because he did agree to keep his mouth shut about this, you know, like he, you know, there, the, um, the establishment of trust between him and the person that he's doing the story on. But at the same time, you know, like, as, as we established last volume, he committed election fraud for him. Yeah. <laughs> so uh. it's, it, it's really understandable the place that Joe is coming from. But for as uh, for as uh, negatively as they initially frame his coworker, yeah, no, he's got a point too. He certainly does. Yeah, he's feeling frustrated. He's going out into the city streets. He's just like, oh, where do my loyalties lie? What am I supposed to do? And then suddenly as if out of an 80s movie. <laughs> oh, like, it's that it's that meme. It's the meme of the stick figure sitting in the corner covered in uh, black scribbles. And then, OMG, Rachel, hi! She was waiting at his hotel. Hey, it's 9.30. Where have you been? You said you'd be here by 8. <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> I drove 100 miles an hour. It took me two hours to get here. He's like, you said that you weren't good... <laughs> That's like, why okay. I didn't rush to be here on time, because you told me it was an impossibility. Oh, hold Look, on. You, I, you, you drove 100 miles per hour in a blizzard? Yeah, yeah that doesn't yeah. seem safe. Hey. I, get, I get the romantic melodrama, but Rachel, you, you literally said you would not be there. <laughs> why would he have any impetus to be there at that I time? Took you, I took you at your word. Hey, <laughs> hey, she's a manic pixie dream girl in the sea. Oh my god! <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. I I both love and hate it. <laughs> I love it because it's good drama. I hate it because that's literally not what you said. <laughs> hey, but people can do what they not say as well as Joe gets into the passenger seat. <laughs> <laughs> I love that panel transition. It feels it feels like he teleported. Like I know it's supposed to be dramatic, but he's standing by the driver's side. Of the there is, of the van. There, there is, is no way she would be surprised by this. Yeah, he's standing by the pass by the driver's side of the van. There is a black panel and uh, an automatopoeia for a door closing. Turn page. Joe is sitting in the passenger seat. And Rachel's got a look on her face like, "What?" Like he teleported there. 
Oh. See, see the 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 way he did it, the way he did it that quickly is he leaped over the car to the other side. <laughs> no, he dukes a hazard across the hood. That's yeah. why she's staring in shock the entire time. Like that was so cool. <laughs> dukes a hazard slid right across. I didn't know your ass was able to slide like that so easily. Conveniently, we have a two-hour drive. I'm gonna see how far your ass can slide. <laughs> 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 a two-hour drive if she goes 100 mph again in a blizzard in colorado i also love how we just the end of this is them deciding to drive the way back to her position together and then we cut to mayor blackburn for several chapters yeah <laughs> it's them driving away into a blizzard for all we know they crashed and died Considering we we see Joe before we see the like revelation of what happened with this meeting, like we we literally just are not told what happens until like very close to the end of our reading. Yeah, so. but uh, we do get into uh, the Mayor Blackburn arc, which uh, involves oh a boy. blonde man talking to Mayor Blackburn, <laughs> who is not the main blonde man. <laughs> that, that is not Albert Noah. You would be forgiven for thinking otherwise, but he is a different bl he's a different blonde man with a square jaw. He's got a different swoosh in his bangs. Kind it's, of. it's longer and it goes out further away from his forehead. That's how you tell the difference. Because Noah also has a swoosh in his bangs, just so you know. It has been a while since we've seen him. This blonde guy in a suit is uh, trying to convince uh, Blackburn to side with Noah by offering a uh, a national position uh, when Noah gets the presidency. <laughs> and Blackburn is not taking it. <laughs> he is not having this at all. Kicks that guy out, then immediately gets on the phone because he's excited. Someone <laughs> wants something from him, which means he can ask for more. Yeah. <laughs> I do like uh, Blackburn. He puts on this like grandfatherly aura of, oh, I'm just an old man. You young whippersnappers should be the ones leading the nation. I'm just comfortable here in the five boroughs being the mayor. And oh, now, now they want something from me. Now I can get everything I need. The instant, the instant a door closes, mm. he gets a super villain grin. <laughs> God doesn't let a door close without opening a window. I love it because he even sits in he sits in the chair. He doesn't quite do the finger steepling thing, but he looks like uh, the dad from Evangelion for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that th this section does really well is it does a good job of specifically characterizing Blackburn's political career too. Because right away, um, yeah, like like I mean, one of the big things is that. Yamaoka in particular, but a lot of people will say, you know, this man is a true politician, but it really sells it because without ever explaining this, like in, in any kind of meaningful detail, it, the way that he talks with people, it becomes pretty obvious that um, Blackburn as a, uh, from a political perspective has never really had enough support to go anywhere, but he recognizes that because he has the capacity to swing either guarantee New York for Noah or open up the race by uh, supporting Yamaoka, that he can basically create what's functionally a political bidding war between the two of them to um, uh, get him on their side. And it really does feel like this is the way that he has always, you know, worked through his political career, where he's not necessarily, like, had the kind of clout that someone like, um, you know, Noah or Yamaoka have, but he is very good at, at finding these opportunities and using them to his advantage. And uh, we get the cut from him, like, coming to this realization he can, like, levy for more with a cut to uh, the Noah campaign as his campaign head gets off the phone very angry <laughs> that um, their offer got rescinded and uh, is not nearly as angry as Noah is when he finds out they gave him an offer at all. <laughs> Because he did not ask them to do that. <laughs> He's just like, you made us look weak. Because uh, we get my favorite thing about Noah, which is the light Yagami uh, L relationship he has with Yamaoka, <laughs> where they both know exactly how the game is played and are only making missteps because other people are failing them. Because <laughs> uh, the big thing is, and again, sort of like showing the political deftness, deftness of Blackburn, he immediately goes to Colorado, at which point Yamaoka is like, somebody on Noah's staff offered him a position. <laughs> Tuck realizes this as well. 
-hmm. because Tuck also is in that category. Tuck is amazing. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Tuck appears in his turtleneck and is just like, yeah, I'm just solving all the problems here. (laughs) Tuck is basically magic, and we love him for it. Uh, Tuck's entire role in this is basically for uh, Arthur to say a thing out loud and Tuck to sit back in his computer chair going like, you didn't already know that? Well, we're (laughs) just going to have to work around it. Here's how we do it. The next bit that we get is uh, (laughs) recognizing he has to deal with the situation. Noah yells at the other blonde man, whose (laughs) name is Meyer, I looked up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Meyer, my favorite dude. I, I was going to skip ahead to uh, Noah and Blackburn meeting in person, uh, the two of them talking face to face. That basically is the next part, because this arc does have a lot of um, people talking about what they're going to do and then doing it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, fair. That's how you write something like this. But yeah, Talk about it in cool guy dialogue. He offers, I, I forget what the thing is. It, it's not a cabinet position, because he specifically calls out that I can't guarantee that the Senate would approve you. Mm-hmm. But it's, it, you know, he, he, he's talking around uh, what position in specific uh, he's offering, but it, it's, you know, basically one step down from that. And uh, Blackburn is continuing to hold out. And one, one of the fun bits is in the conversation with his staff afterward over, uh, uh, like, one of, one of his staffers is like, does he want a cabinet position? He should know that that's too much under any circumstances. We can't even guarantee that. And Noah just gives a look and he's like, was he asking for the second seat? <laughs> <laughs> is he trying to become vice president? Well, it's way too early to pick a vice president, too, and he knows it. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah, because the other thing, because the other thing is, uh, like, like in a lot of cases, Noah doesn't just say it out loud because <laughs> political mm-hmm. drama. We have to talk around everything. We yep. gotta get King Blackburn to turn around. <laughs> I love the whole King Blackburn thing. It it is such a it it's such a powerful force of a uh, characterization. I mean, it's, well, it's pretty accurate though because you mm-hmm. have those politicians who are literal linchpins to like communities that you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to he, play your cards right because their support can either make or break your campaign. He, he's both king and king maker. Mm -hmm. Yes, because he is a popular figure in New York, like New Mm -hmm. York City, huge population base. But then they also established he has a lot of friends within like the local government of Albany, Mm -hmm. which is like the other major population center. And those two combined can basically like get you all of New York. Yep. (laughs) I I just love this section uh, because it brings my boy Tuck back. (laughs) Oh, Tuck's got his turtleneck. He looks so cute. (laughs) (laughs) He he looks so cozy in every panel he's in. I, I want that turtleneck. It's comfy. <laughs> but yeah, one of the, like one of the big things in characterizing Blackburn early on that, you know, they, they reinforce all throughout. But like one of the big things is that he knows he's that important. He understands his position that he could never really build support for himself. He can basically uh, select a front runner. It's also a thing about Blackburn is he actually doesn't want to leave New York City. Mm. Yeah. He genuinely cares about the city to a degree. Thing is, he genuinely cares about the city, and also he says that a lot, though. I do kind of wonder if if he was offered VP, if he'd take that. You know, it's one of those ones where uh, there is also, like, the political artifice of uh, he will absolutely jump on opportunities when he sees them. So I mean, being offered vice presidency is kind of like, though, like, hey, do you have morals? What if I gave you two million dollars? It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Tuck says 10 million. <laughs> well, <laughs> that... they do they do the math of what the value Noah's campaign must have offered him. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the uh, equivalent in 2000s money. <laughs> Hope the Hampton it must be nice to have a bank in the family. Let's make use of that, huh? I love how multiple characters in this section mention that outright. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, uh, next up, uh, Yamaoka is doing a campaign visit at the uh, the Sakura Square for um, the uh, Japanese uh, American coalition in Denver, I think. Mm-hmm. And he, he basically does a speech on um, the discrimination like Japanese Americans felt after uh, World War II. War, yeah, World War II with the concentration camps. Mm-hmm. And uh, he notices in the audience, uh, Mayor Blackbird is listening <laughs> to his speech. He's which... standing there like a JoJo villain. 
which is great because the people around him notice he's there and step away from him. So he then gets the crowd dispersed around him to the point <laughs> that his campaign, uh, uh, Yamaoka's campaign manager is basically like, we should ask him to leave. This is making this speech worthless. <laughs> but it's like, no, hold on. Yamaoka does the power yeah. play. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. Yamaoka totally does the power play of like, uh, and and someone else who knows is how uh, dealing with racial inequality. The Honorable Gilbert Blackburn, why don't you say a few words? And um, <laughs> he pops his hat off like, ah, oh, you got me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I was hiding in, in plain sight. <laughs> That's my. That is one of my favorite panels. <laughs> it's, it's, he looks like a circus performer with his pose. <laughs> Well, he's an old man. He's probably shrunk yeah. a lot. So he's like, Wee! <laughs> <laughs> my other favorite thing is this perpetuates the myth that this uh, manga loves saying, which is every politician is able to make a speech on command with no preparation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Just pull it, pull an entire monologue right out of their ass. I mean, to be fair, I, I wouldn't have necessarily put past Blackburn actually his speech is very stump it's probably something he's prepared and can talk about on it yeah. like these people are professional public speakers I'm not doubting their ability I'm just saying yeah. there is no preparation on Unless he came there knowing he would get invited on stage, which is interesting. Well, that's, no, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, because I think I like he's he's spoken with Noah in person and now he is going to the other guy bidding for him. And mm -hmm. I think he wanted to get noticed by Yamaoka and expected because like like Yamaoka every time has swung for the fences with everything that's ever come up. We learn that Blackburn uh, has known Yamaoka for years. So mm -hmm. he probably could have expected that, like, if I show up, he's probably going to notice me. And if he notices me, he's going to pull the power play. So I'll have a little speech prepared that's designed with the express purpose of dodging, uh, endorsing him for president, but making it sound like I'm about to. Yeah. And it the important thing is the speech is nothing but platitudes. It's him going up and saying that. Ah, uh, yes, in uh, my city of New York and here in Denver. No, in the whole United States, we uh, strive to create a more perfect union, blah, blah, blah. The politics is where that battle takes place. I will continue to fight for a, a better future. And it's all boilerplate stuff that he could say without thinking. So it, I wholly believe that he intended to do this and... Uh, but even if he didn't have a specific speech prepared, he knew this was going to happen he, and probably he just had the bullet points in his head. He was going to mm -hmm. talk to the press afterwards, and then Yamaoka is like, I know you're going to do that anyway. Win points Why don't you do me. it up here near me? Make it sound like I did it. Yeah, it's a, it's a very cool scene. There's lots of uh, wheels moving in it for what essentially amounts to, in-universe, about five minutes. Yeah, and I mean, like, it, one of the one of the big things uh, about this is that it, you know, like we we've seen a bunch of times where Yamaoka has like like here's the thing that is the logical thing that we should do. Okay, Yamaoka says he then turns in the exact opposite direction and, <laughs> and swings for the fences with the most ridiculous political plan that he can possibly think of. You sort of get the impression that like again, Blackburn saw it coming and was ready for it and was able to use it to his own advantage because that was also a statement to noah that he's saying i'm aware of who the other person bidding for me is you know mm -hmm. and it really sets up blackburn as you know because like yamaoka has not missed once so far mm -hmm. and it really wow. sets up uh it really sets up blackburn as uh like an actual equal in that sense that like he's also the type of person to do that i, I love this uh particular line as uh, they are talking after the event, uh, and Yamaoka is going on about, well, basically being a shonen protagonist and saying, uh, the election isn't a trading floor. The only people who deserve to be here are ones with a sense of a mission, those with ideals. And that gets a rise out of Blackburn, which actually, you know, paging through the manga uh, with retrospect, uh, that look on his face after Yamaoka says that is uh it's it's good foreshadowing cool. it's yeah. good foreshadowing because he looks he look it it could be read as like a uh a moment of shock like oh wow this this uh young buck really uh is uh holding tight to his ideals 
But then you notice it's got the warped background of someone who's in, in emotional distress that this manga likes to do. So you see that he's he's angry. And there's Yamaoka with his big, uh, like, fake smile that he loves doing. Mm-hmm. But Mayor Blackburn heads off in his car, and uh, they're going to talk later. We'll see each other soon. And if not in person, then on television. But unfortunately. I, I don't know why I love that line so much. <laughs> it's a good line. But uh, unfortunately, there is breaking news just as Mayor Blackburn left. Uh, there was some racially charged police violence as a young black teenager in Louisiana was beaten up from some police officers. And I got to say, of all the things this manga has gotten accurate, the number of Democrats foaming at the mouth <laughs> at the idea <laughs> of racially charged police violence. Uh, oh, that physically hurt me to read. And they they are career politicians a, yeah. who are excited by the prospect of it or disappointed. Someone has a line that is literally, why couldn't this have happened at a more convenient time? And like, buddy, uh -huh. this shouldn't have happened at all. <laughs> yeah, but it the timing. Blackburn is barely out of sight driving down the street when one of Yamoka's press guys runs up to him screaming about this. And and sort of going along with that whole, uh, like, it's such an accurate uh, representation of career politicians, which isn't necessarily an American thing. I think that's a career politician thing anywhere. But like, there's that, there's that brilliant disconnect of the guy runs up to Yamaoka. Good news! A young black man was beaten to death by police! Oh, so good so news! <laughs> no, in all fairness, the guy who is giving the news is actually distraught about it. Uh, but another it's, guy, but another right, guy has like beaming smile on his face. Sir, this is explosive! Local affiliates want your comment! It's the situation of it's like, uh... They are opportunistic. They are not yeah, happy this happened, I guess we should clarify, well, but, but they I, are that's happy actually, at the opportunity. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's, that's kind of what I'm apparently failing at getting at. The, the thing is, they're letting their excitement for the opportunity overtake how awful what's going on is. And that's such a normal thing that happens to so many people. It's so real and so natural and so painful to see in, yeah, in so far as that. Yamaoka is just like, we need to get him on his car phone before he reads any newspapers, before he sees anything, if he listens on the radio. We need to get call him now because he needs to sign on to a deal before he realizes this has literally made him the most valuable person in this election to have on your side. Uh-huh. Because he is a known civil rights leader. Like, yeah. That like, is they're... his bread and butter. Like, yeah. And like, and like, people are talking about how this is, this is just happened and is already garnering national attention. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a, a great, uh, characterization moment from blackburn he doesn't he doesn't know about this yet uh but still when the car phone starts ringing and his uh secretary guy goes to pick it up he puts his arm he he, he like grabs him by the arm it's like hold on hold on ring 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 now <laughs> let him cook <laughs> let him stew you remember what we said about uh, how Yamaoka just swings for the fences at every opportunity? I was so happy about the way that this ended up uh, playing out. <laughs> he he swung for the he swung for the fences so hard on this one it practically knocked me out of my chair, <laughs> and I'm on oh. the other side of the fourth wall. Because he he doubles down on I am not interested in this. He's just like, hey, Mayor Blackburn, I thought I'd just call you up. Um, I'm just, I didn't want to say this in person, but like you're getting a little on in years. Do you really think you can keep in the politics game? And look, hey, my family's got a nice bank. Maybe you want an escape plan. That's why you've been talking to Noah. You're looking for a way out because you don't think you can win re-election. And I've heard the rumors. I don't think you can win re-election either, buddy. But don't worry. I remember all the good times we've had. I can help you out. I can sort you out with like a nice cushy bank job. You'll make a good salary and live out your golden years in peace. I'm sure your wife would appreciate some nice trips, not constantly having to deal with this, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, and it kind of works on it. Because here's the thing. 
that was something Blackbird is worried about. Like he uh -huh. does, oh, he's yeah. very worried about his reelection. You can see it honestly affecting him. Like it's start, it's sort of working for the audacity of it all. And then <laughs> the manga paneling, like an act from God, a red light stops the car so Blackburn can see on a big screen TV the news live from Louisiana. Some of the best facial expressions, because again, what I was saying about how uh, politicians can let the excitement of an opportunity uh, overwhelm their reaction, their what should be their reaction to a tragedy. Blackbird is so elated. <laughs> yeah, he is, he is fist pumping at the idea of this. There's a panel where he looks like he's honestly angry, like, ah, oh, the injustice of this. Those who have committed this will pay. Next panel, beaming expression, wide smile, fists raised. Yes, this is my moment. And he so, comes back at Kenneth swinging. Because he's suddenly like, well, I don't need you. I just became the most valuable person. Mm-hmm. I and can I mean can ride this national protest out into re-election no problem this is my game this is what i have made my career on you are in my house i am not playing by your rules right now and mm -hmm. I, I i gotta say i am just so happy that even even with the way that this ends and we'll get to it but i am just so happy that yamaoka swings for the fences and finally misses because it was getting to the point where like he was he was throwing a little bit too many Hail Marys that were always right. It, it's a weird comparison, but he feels like a character in an RPG, a player character who uh, realized they messed up a speech check and is now desperately scrambling to uh, <laughs> salvage the situation. Well, honestly, the thing I like the most about this moment is that it was Yamaoka's own audacity that was the problem. Because mm -hmm. he was so aggressive and condescending with Blackburn, he has to smooth that over now if he wants to get this back. Can he even get this back after what he said? Because he, 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 he literally basically did say, get out of the game, old man. I can give you the parachute you need. It was very mean and, and condescending. And again, it almost worked, but you know... You know, the, the, the fact that one of these insane plays finally failed and now he has to recover not just from a bad situation, but a bad situation of his own creation, I think is really yep. important because uh, he, he was starting to a little bit feel like a, uh, a politics version of Superman invulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> Could do no wrong. Yep. We'll, we'll discuss a bit more of the blowback of this particular action uh, in a moment, because we are about halfway through our reading here, so we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back in uh, just a moment with more of this uh, insanity. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, everybody, where last we left off our intrepid reporter, Takashi Joe. Uh, he drove off into a blizzard and maybe died. Uh, what? Where we last left our president hopeful, uh, Kenneth Yamaoka, he had just seriously uh, fumbled the ball when it came to winning the favor of uh, Kingmaker King Blackburn. And as a quarterback, he knows one or two things about fumbling balls. Sure. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not saying... I'm not making that joke. We're moving on. We're not putting explicit on this episode. <laughs> we're not putting explicit on this episode. I am moving on. <laughs> we're, we're moving on to the conversation. Uh, Yamaoka, um, against Arthur's protests, goes to... Um, <laughs> it, again, it's it, it's kind of nice because for all the times that Yamaoka has made ridiculous choices and been right every time, when Arthur is like, you're not going to go beg to him uh, to 
for an endorsement, are you? And uh, Yamaoka is like, yeah, I am, because I don't have a choice. I screwed up. <laughs> like, I like that he actually has to, you know, like, like he, he actually takes an L and uh, has to deal with that. This is only the second time that I've felt so humiliated. <laughs> Well, Blackburn says that, but um, <laughs> uh, it is uh, probably fair that Yamaoka feels similarly. I do love the paneling of Yamaoka arriving at uh, Blackburn's hotel room. Hotel room? Sweet. It's a ballroom, I think. <laughs> it's a ballroom, but he's walking around it like it's his hotel room. It's no, got a... Uh, it must be a hotel room, actually. Yeah, you're right. But, like, it, the rooms are so big. <laughs> It, it's got it's got double doors that lead off to a balcony that we don't see. It's got a dining table. It's got uh, couches. It's got it a desk. A, it's got apparently a spotlight he's standing under as he's uh, telling all of the press corps to be ready for when he arrives back at JFK. <laughs> I will defend this. I think for Denver, this is a reasonable size for a VIP hotel room. Mm -hmm. It's when we get in Washington, D.C. and New York City and the rooms are this size. I'm like, hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he also gets a call from Noah's campaign and uh, Blackburn, the uh, the career politician that he is, he keeps uh, um, holding his cards close to uh, his chest and still is not giving an outright answer. He, you know, he's saying that uh, tomorrow, once I arrive back in JFK, uh, I, I love this paneling. Yamoka arrives. He knocks on the door. Can I have a word with the mayor? He's poised up there like he's ready to go into battle and turn page. It's Blackburn sitting on a comfy armchair like it's a medieval throne. <laughs> Blackburn. <laughs> it's such a it's such a powerful uh, juxtaposition as the two of them are set across from one another, <laughs> and Blackburn basically enters third-act villain breakdown gloat mode. I mean, like, here's the hilarious thing. We get a backstory flashback, except it's for <laughs> Blackburn <laughs> to Yamaoka. There, there is a sense of, uh, and actually sort of the funny thing, there is a sense of, uh, uh, you remember that time when, with, like, the way that the ex exposition is delivered, but the thing is, it actually does a really good job of justifying why it's uh, set up that way, because basically what Blackburn is saying is um, that first time we met when our uh, when our connections through politics were first forged, you filed a class action lawsuit against me. And before the trial, I got a recording of me being criminally corrupt that would have put me in jail if this evidence had been pre presented. Uh, and and so I shut up for the trial and and took a dive. And then afterward, when when you came up to me and saying, you know, like let's look past this and work together from now on, I realized it was you who sent me that blackmail. You'd had me under your thumb for ten years. Such a um, good panel when he gets that realization. It's like suddenly I knew it was you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The one where he first gets the blackmail, like the panel is obviously him taking his glasses off, but like his hand is kind of small and in the corner. So I like to imagine he jolted so hard they fell off his face. <laughs> J just for context, it doesn't matter terrible much, but for but uh, the class action lawsuit was um, the government was going to evict a whole bunch of people in the South Bronx for gentrification. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's a little messed and the up. The blackmail proved Blackburn did this knowing because I think it was implied he was getting kickbacks from the company. Yeah, kickbacks oh, no, from it, the contractor. He he says it outright. He They had basically paid for his most recent campaign and he was paying back that favor. And one of the one of the big things is up to this point, like, again, this is like where the foreshadowing of him reacting to Yamaoka's comments about not wanting to pay him off uh that being foreshadowing of of it being a bit more personal for him than it than it initially appeared he very specifically is the like the model corrupt politician like a bunch of companies have him in his back pocket it it, it wasn't ultra clear up until that point like it had, it had been it seemed like he was the kind of idealist that yamaoka was but the more time you spent with him the more that 
ideas started to erode and you mm -hmm. saw how opportunistic he was and and you know and then we get to this point and he's like and yeah also i should be in jail for that crime that i committed that you know he he says that you didn't reveal in that trial and that's why i've always been on your side and then Yamaoka doing the thing he's done for every case where there's been any kind of serious conflict in a way that uh, brilliantly avoids um, confirming or denying literally anything. He claims that he didn't know about uh, the uh, the kickbacks and that he was that he had pursued that trial completely independent of of any of any blackmail but i knew it was you i i said earlier that um during the sucker the sucker square speeches that blackburn was posed up like a jojo villain he looks like a jojo <laughs> villain here oh when, when he's pointing at uh yamaoka going like for 10 years you had me under your thumb but no more <laughs> <laughs> yeah 10 years senator Yes, sir, Kenneth, it was worth the wait. <laughs> Just the manic grin on his face. Oh, good. Such good oh. paneling. And then, and... Uh, conveniently, this is when the Noah campaign calls him, and he takes the call. Mm -hmm. Right there in front of Yamoka. And they have, they both have, like, this vague half a conversation, because mm -hmm. Blackburn is playing up the offer to be better, or at least more direct than it necessarily is, so that uh kenneth can stew a little and and once again he he says that you'll get my answer uh when i arrive at uh jfk mm -hmm. which i mean basically he's he, he's saying whether or not noah's campaign knew that yamaoka was in the room that what that means is obvious you know he's gotten he he's gotten both of the offers at this point um but yeah. he's still not he's still not committing to one side or the other and then uh, uh, Yamaoka has one of my favorite uh, Yamaoka-isms right here, <laughs> where he goes, uh, hold on, it's, um, you're already king, and now you want to be emperor, but you're not wearing any clothes. What? <laughs> Naked, a gag in your mouth, hands and feet bound, you may as well be riding in a thumb, in a tumbrel. I don't actually know what that was, I thought that was Sumble, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not the only one who who uh, didn't know what that meant. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's an open cart. You know, Neat. it's it it is a uh, it is a uh, spectacular uh, undress uh, undressing hat da -da -da, of uh, Blackburn. And I just, so, yeah. I just love how Blackburn has the reaction I normally have when he says things. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? What? What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, has a has a bit of a habit of uh, non sequiturring hard enough to uh, somehow come up on, come out on top every time. This is a man who wants to be president of the United States. He kind of has to. <laughs> uh, but Yamoka turns this around into, "Hey, I bet you're real sick of playing to all those donors, aren't you? Of having to have all those special interests uh, suckling up to them, huh?" Well, how about I give you a strategy so you won't have to? Yeah, what is it? You're making an announcement tomorrow. I'll make an announcement tomorrow. We'll trade and see if you think that's worth your endorsement. On one hand, Yamaoka is now throwing back in Blackburn's face the thing that he's been doing this entire time. He's making a point of not committing to anything until the last minute. And then on the other hand, Yamaoka also knows that no matter what he says to Blackburn, Blackburn's not going to give him a straight answer until he gives the press conference at JFK. So why not play his game? We get to both of these press conferences happening, and uh, my my least favorite part of uh, our reading happened because uh, for all that build up, uh, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't think what Yamaoka said in his press conference. Well, because what happens is Blackburn gets off the plane, is literally about to announce he's going to support Noah, <laughs> was the strong implication. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because their campaign gave him an actual offer, rather than watch the TV. <laughs> but yeah. conveniently, they timed the press conference to be on the air as his plane... You know, not conveniently, that's something you would know and could very easily plan around, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Yamaoka is going through... He cuts Blackburn off from his announcement so that everyone can watch his thing where he goes, 
I am announcing my new plan for education reform that I will title after a famous career politician and mentor to me personally. The Blackburn Program. And essentially what it is is his plan is to fund low-income schools with taxes from high-income areas. And that is brought from something that Blackburn said earlier on. It's basically his platform. Uh, Yamamoka is, Yamaoka is just basically saying, I'm going to take this to a national standard, but call it after him. Which is, I, which is amazing his... because you know that raising it to a national standard will, you know, filter in those, those dollars to the state initiatives. It's also I, something I, a president has no power to do. And it's an insane <laughs> thing to promise. Well, the other, the other thing that bugs me about it is that, that Matt mentioned about how it, it does have a connection to Blackburn. It mostly feels like the thing that's supposed to be the big whammy moment is naming it after Blackburn, which is just fanning his ego. That's not really an offer. <laughs> like, I don't get why this... Oh, It yeah. seems so cheap. What, <laughs> what it is, is it's, like, giving him an ego boost, because what he's actually looking for is more political clout for, yes, I'm still in the game. So what he's taking is, like, give me one more push to ride in through, like, good press to win my re-election. I've already accepted this is going to be my last term as mayor. I just need that last little push. And that's what um, Yamaoka was saying in that meeting was, I'll give you something that you don't need to be asking a whole bunch of donors to give you PR for. I'll just give you this PR. Mm -hmm. I will sing your praises about what a great, like, idea you have, how you are going to revolution. It is, like, he is singing his praises. Mm. Yep. I, I will admit, I think naming a thing after him isn't the push he needs. I think the manga is expecting you to, like, follow those context clues and think that's enough. But my thing is, the president has no power to do any of this, so... <laughs> Well, and and also, like, one of the big things that they've done so specifically to characterize Blackburn up to this point is that you can't just, you know, you can't buy him cheaply is, like, one of the biggest characteristics because the whole point of him, like, not committing until the last minute is he's trying to get the highest bid. Mm -hmm. For all this legitimately great buildup, it feels like the thing that sways him is so small in comparison. I think what you're supposed to take away is Blackburn, Blackburn values, like, political clout so much more than, like... Than positions. Yeah, because positions takes away his power. He doesn't want that. He wants to be in charge of New... Because there's things he wants to do in New York that he hasn't been able to because his corporate donors have been tying his hands. Basically, yeah. this is the conclusion of the conversation he's had with Yamaoka, where he was basically promising, I can give you one more turn without any, like, thing to tie you down to do whatever you want. Yeah. And, yeah, and I mean, like, that, that that's a fair and accurate assessment. I, I think the big thing for me is, like, at least in part, they don't do anything to imply he wasn't asking for the VPC. I think he would have taken the VPC, the thing is. I, I think that's like what I said earlier. It's like, you can have morals, but then $2 million is $2 million, you know? The thing from my perspective is, for all the buildup, this feel, this wasn't, this wasn't presented as, like, the big sweeping thing that turns it around. It feels like the main character has to win now so the manga can keep going. I don't think that, you know, like, the Blackburn program was framed adequately enough to justify all the all the time it took to get there i guess mm. i think it really depends on you fully getting that blackburn's motivation is not like he wants his legacy improved he doesn't want yeah. power for power's sake and he doesn't want money he wants mayor of new york blackburn to be pushed up to emperor rather than yeah. Yeah. you want to be given another kingdom to rule. He doesn't want that. Like, yeah, and that's I, what everyone has been trying to give him is things he doesn't want. Yeah, I, I, think the, I think the big thing is, as you've been going through all of that, Matt, it's like, oh yeah, I get it now. But the problem is, I didn't, I didn't get that from the context clues given in the story. I don't think that that was adequately emphasized. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it could have been explained better, and I... I don't know. Naming a program after him is probably, it doesn't have the same impact. I think, I'm going to be honest, if he had like suggested like a, mem a, mem a mem not a memorial library, but like something that was more of an obvious ego project, 
Yeah. That's, well, naming well, an education reform is basically an ego project because his well, plan is... It, his, his, his plan is a politician's plan to solve the poor people's problem. It's, yeah, it's one of those. But I, I think I think maybe one thing that could have helped is, and like this is the immediate thought that I had when we got to this conclusion. I really wish I knew what Blackburn's own pet projects were because he never gets attached to like education, for example. And if it if one thing that had come out when he was doing his backstory flashback is that one thing that the special interests did was prevented him from, I don't know, having an education reform where he uses the tax the the tax money from wealthy areas to fund low income schools or something. like like if 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 he had been attached to that idea yeah it it literally just gets brought up uh in the beginning when they're talking about why he's such a big civil rights leader like that's the thing he says is like we need to get rid of income inequality because that's like a big like that's he it's literally like two panels so if he had been more strongly attached to what the Blackburn program actually ended up being, then I feel like that would have carried through better. But that's sort of the one thing that we're missing is what his actual ideals are. Because like even even those those couple of panels in the beginning, they could just be him politics speaking. You don't know. It doesn't it doesn't get and, and I feel like his flashback would have been a great time to like show like maybe his early days or something. Well to, the like, problem show... was his flashback was when he was already corrupt. So it's like No, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, 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 it it's it's a structural thing. But that is my big critique of this because for all the for all the legitimately great buildup, and I really loved this little Blackburn arc because it was, I think, Eagle at its most eagle. Uh the ending really felt like a letdown to me because it's like it really did kind of feel like well this arc's over we got to get the main character to win so we can move on to the next uh part yeah well time, time for the other main character to re-enter the story as blackburn sponsors uh senator yamaoka for uh presidency archer is, is uh not happy about <laughs> <laughs> or uh uh not albert. Arthur. it's Ar arthur is happy about it yeah. noah Albert Noah is very Albert, yeah. mad about it. Albert is such a weird name for Noah. <laughs> I always say I never trust a man with two first names. Albert, Arthur, and Alex. There are a lot of A names in this. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a real A team. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the Amok uh, headquarters is uh, celebrating like they just won a primary for this. They basically and did. <laughs> they yeah, they basically did. What they what they really won, they didn't win the primary. They they won the uh, the stage to win New York because the big thing about Blackburn is had he supported Noah, then all the other Democratic candidates might as well just drop out of the race right now. Mm -hmm. If he supports Yamaoka, on the other hand, now suddenly Noah has to campaign to actively win New York. Yeah, because because Noah is basically a percentage point and a half away from just having yeah, the, the primary. The yeah. yeah. So um, uh, in Blackburn supporting the, uh, the second candidate, suddenly New York is not certain anymore. And mm -hmm. that convinces Noah to finally agree to uh, debate, specifically Yamaoka. Technically, the other two candidates are there. They're... they're they sure are there. <laughs> they sure are there, those patsies. Oh, we will get to the other one who I want to talk about, because <laughs> they made choices with him. <laughs> the most southern man to ever southern to exist. I've out southern my own face. <laughs> <laughs> This stuff with the Blackburn might have been eagle at its most eagle, but uh, that's, I think, mostly because we haven't uh, seen all of the debate just yet. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Everyone's getting ready to head to New York, where the next leg is. They're celebrating, I, I believe the Colorado primaries happen in the background. Uh, they're yeah. a foregone conclusion, basically. Um, they're just happy to have gotten the points with um, Senate, uh, with uh, Mayor Blackburn. So, Yeah, the, but, the, the big thing was, uh, it was another primary where they knew Noah would win the, the overall popular vote. Mm -hmm. It was just how close does Yamaoka get in being in second place the and they were to gain ground yeah. and gain ground they did if i remember correctly their plan isn't even like outright win the primaries it's get the other people to drop out and support yamaoka to then at the end like take it from noah yeah they are they are very much playing the long game but uh the this is when con. 
Uh, we uh, have uh, Joe, who just is in the campaign office after we thought he died in a blizzard. Uh, <laughs> as he is reminiscing about the night where they drove in the bl blizzard for the two-hour uh, drive. Dude falls asleep within ten minutes. <laughs> to be who... fair, Rachel pulls over and does the same, but... Well, that's yeah. after he falls asleep, though. That, yeah, that's after he falls asleep, yeah. One of the other staffers who um, makes some interesting comments. Uh... <laughs> hey, uh, hey, don't you talk bad about Sarah. She's amazing. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah is, is amazing, yes. It, I vibe I, with Sarah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it, it's Sarah specifically asking how things are going between uh, Takashi and Rachel. Uh, me, me and happened? Rachel, what, what do you mean? Well, I'm just mentioning the fact you guys both showed up at like 11 a.m. one day, both like hours late to work. Uh, the <laughs> night after you drove together for a while? I'm, I'm just assuming you guys had campaign set. Also, mm, I forgot to... <laughs> she is having a flashback and he imagines the kiss and he's just like, was that campaign sex? And I'm like, buddy, you... <laughs> Basically. Basically. I know you think it was campaign sex, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> not not quite. But Sarah definitely thinks they had sex. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she wants the juicy details because it's Sarah a is a gossip. Goss. She's also kind of holding a torch for Yamaoka. Yeah, she basically goes, everyone hooks up on campaigns because it's so hot and everyone's just got a, like, big emotions running wild and everything. You just mm -hmm. kind of fall into it. And she... uh uh joe's just like what well have you ever fallen for anyone's like no i got rejected by the only man i've ever had feelings for she does a weird horse metaphor everyone uh with the with the fervor of election night everyone turns into stallions and mares but there's only one pegasus i'm after but he flies right over people like me and i'm like okay you're you've taken this a step too far it's weird now <laughs> Then when Joe leaves to go, he's been motivated to go finish his thing because he has the flashback further where he's just like, yeah, no, we both woke up in the van together and we were, <laughs> the van was buried on the road in like a solid, like half a foot of snow. So I'm like, I don't know how you get out of here. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yeah, I, guys, I, I don't know either, but <laughs> you guys were very late for work. <laughs> But, They're like uh, about to kiss when all of a sudden Rachel's like, wait, what time is it? It's 10 o'clock. Ah, shit. Uh, as they're headed out, uh, we get the weird thing of Sarah just going like, man, what is it about Japanese men that just make me go for them? And I'm like, <laughs> Sarah. Ways. She is down astronomical. Arthur that makes some vague threats about getting too close to Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the president's family is the first target of gossip. It'd be really bad if anything unseemly happened. Anyway, have a good night. <laughs> we get the immortal line. Takashi says, no chromo. <laughs> he has the existential fear of like, oh God, wait, no, you're right. She is only my sister by marriage. But I just realized if it ever comes out that I'm Yamahoka's son, this is a huge can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone else in America will understand that. Uh, You'll which... get the Alabama vote, but then the other states. <laughs> uh, there, there is a reason why it's this relationship is taboo. This is the <laughs> there. Uh, he, he's still an endearing character because this is the one kind of this is the one version that is acceptable. Mm. Uh, Gosh, to cut. God, Takashi and Rachel actually managed to uh, turn Alabama purple. It's the power of love, everyone. It's the power of love. For love, all things are possible. I could <laughs> see that happening in this manga. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> As you know, incest is super popular in Alabama. <laughs> they, in fact, do say that it is wincest. I mean, you do have two things on their side. They're not biologically related, nor were they relate, like raised in the same even society. Yeah. Yeah, that is true, too. So we okay. uh, cut to my favorite steakhouse, which is Fresh, fresh Meats. meats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. After all this sexual tension, that's where I want to go for dinner. Fresh meat. I mean, it's a different type of, you know, appetite, but I'll take it. Mm. <laughs> uh. 
We we get a, a classic image of Rachel looking out the window, uh, wondering where Joe is. As Joe's looking at the window at the ho- at the hotel, like, do I do this? I really shouldn't. <laughs> but you know, you but, want to. Mine's telling me no. But my body telling me yes. Uh, and and as we si- and and don't kill my saying- sister. <laughs> and, and, and as we and as we uh, give this important caveat, we cut to Yamoka in a bathrobe. <laughs> Even the sexual tension high. <laughs> <laughs> As his wife comes into the room wearing possibly the most clothes someone could wear. <laughs> Seriously, she's... She's... She looks she's like she's about to go to a Victorian-era formal ball? She, <laughs> she is wearing slippers, but then is also wearing, like, a full, like, ankle-length skirt mm-hmm. and a sweater on top of a separate turtleneck i didn't want him to get any ideas so you know i had to put some more layers on uh-huh. my dreadful husband was barely nude <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh she is being informed that uh takashi wants to interview her oh actually i'm sorry he, she is informing uh yamaoka that takashi wants to interview and is asking him if that's okay yeah and he's like yeah sure whatever at which point i'm like hmm <laughs> When we see, like, this, like, bit building up to the interview, Joe following uh, Patricia around, one thing that we see immediately is she is just as much of a politician as her husband is. So, like, it's not surprising that he's on board with her. uh... Yeah, can we we talk about the working woman's uh, speech she gives? That, 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 that was such a surreal moment. It was uncanny yeah she shows up for the working women's rally in i think central park and uh she's being like okay does anyone here have any questions and this uh lady steps forward holding a baby and is like yeah i have a question hey uh rich lawyer uh heiress to a banking empire what do you actually know about needing to struggle to live i i will give her props she does not lie and say, I know what it's like to struggle, which is mm-hmm. infinite points. <laughs> like the, the, the weird part is like, yes, that is a legitimate question. But the woman asking it has a like a weird evil grin An evil grin. She's got a gotcha smile the whole time. Like she thinks like anyone could. It's like, well, no, I I can want to help people while not being immediately a victim to the same circumstances um yeah. but i can Empa- give you a politician answer and then pick up your baby <laughs> empathy and sympathy are human emotions are both human emotions just because i haven't struggled does uh struggle to survive as you have doesn't mean i don't understand the value of hard work and want to help others i will now pick up <laughs> i will now pick up your baby as i finish the speech I will now kiss your baby and say it is the cutest baby I have ever seen. It is my baby now. Wait, no, we don't say that. It's yours now. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, and and like, here's the thing. With how melodramatic Eagle the making of an Asian oh, no. American president is, there okay. is honestly, the way I see it, there is a 50-50 shot that either she was a plant by the Yamaoka campaign and that entire sequence was scripted, or... She's just being framed like a supervillain only to get, you know, her heart melted by uh, the sincerity of the Yamaoka campaign because I, Eagle. <laughs> I believe this is just a universe where politicians can just walk up to crowds and grab babies and everyone's just like, that's so cute. <laughs> but honestly, honestly, for me, 50-50, I, I, I don't think we'll ever know. <laughs> but anyway, um... Takashi keeps following her around on her, like, little press round. She's doing all... The, not little. She's doing actual work. I don't know why I diminished it. Um, oh, yeah, she's no. Got, like, a full PR round she's going through. Because, like, yeah. the thing that the thing that's very clear early on, as much as we were joking about that scene, it is actually a really good and really important scene because it sets up... Patricia is just as much of a politician as uh, Kenneth is. Yeah, and, and considering the time when this was released... Uh, like a fir- uh, potential first lady outlying what she was planning to do mattered a lot because we were running off of um uh I'm forgetting Reagan's wife's name but she was like she had Nancy. big personal Nancy Reagan mm-hmm. had like huge personal projects which you can disagree with but she was very active mm. uh and then Barbara Bush and um Hillary Clinton obviously um yeah. all 
all first ladies that did a lot of work. All very intelligent women who were very motivated and also very capable. Whether or not you agree with their politics, that you, you can't question how hard they worked for what they believed in. They took it and ran with it and actually like used the platform to try to do make change. They, they, they took a platform that was traditionally you hosted the dinner parties to like actual political office. Yeah, turned it into something something more substantive. And uh, one thing that, like, what that scene specifically does is it frames Patricia in that same way. She is just as much of a politician as anyone else who's directly involved with the campaign, um, which I think is important for framing the uh, uh, for fl framing the black backstory flashback we're about to get. Because <laughs> uh, she is getting her hair and makeup done before another thing, and that is literally the only free time she has for an interview. <laughs> I think it's a uh, a pretty poignant metaphor that uh, the flashback we get uh, for for Patricia is literally while she is putting on a face. <laughs> that thing about these flashbacks not necessarily being 100% reliable. <laughs> yeah, it, it is uh, her telling how uh, the story of how she and uh, Kenneth met and... Um, yeah, it, it feels like I watched an entire uh, romantic movie in the course of, like, three manga chapters. It really do be like that. Random side note, am I the only one who thinks that the younger Patricia is really, really pretty? Like, you just think that because she's a blonde. <laughs> look. <laughs> <He's wrong. laughs> I'm just saying, maybe you just Not have a type, Jacob. Neither of you are wrong. <laughs> I am not saying we do not shame on this podcast. We just judge. <laughs> Jay and I especially cannot throw stones. <laughs> I, okay, so, but jokes aside, I, I really liked her character design, though. Like, everyone has these sort of, like, uh, like cut and pristine classic designs for most of them. But uh, something about something about the younger Patricia just stood out to me. She felt more, she felt more organically designed, I guess. Her uh, her brother Charles brought young Yamamoka, uh, Kenneth, we'll call him, back home from college to hang out. Um, and she immediately went like, ooh, college boy. <laughs> I don't think she's in high school at this time, but I actually no, she probably is. Because wouldn't she have also gone to Yale? Uh, no, no, she doesn't go to Yale. She goes to a different school. I don't think she's that much younger. She is a, she's a Vietnam War protester, so yeah, actually, they, she might be this like roughly the same age. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. not that much younger because I think she's I think she's in like a prep school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but she has an older brother, and that's actually how she meets him because he brings him home for like whatever reason. Yeah, because the two of them are the same age, so mm -hmm. he's a little bit older than her, but I don't think there there's that much of an age difference. Yeah, nothing them. creepy, just like a couple years younger, oh, maybe. You know what? She she's at a college party in uh, this chapter, so yeah, I, I think she actually that means nothing. <laughs> You're right. She could be any age. Um, I, I think yeah. there is a uh, like single digit year difference. Like, mm. well, that's an awful way to phrase that. I think there is a one or two age year difference. Unless she's a townie, she could be. I we know she's not a townie. Yeah. I, we know where they live. They're from New England. <laughs> yes, but what I mean is she could be local, and therefore it doesn't necessarily mean that she goes to, or attends a school. On the off chance, <laughs> the Hampton family is from Yale. From <laughs> Yale, yes. Wait, Connecticut. Wait, Connecticut's a state. Yes, it is. Connecticut is indeed a state. Everyone. Uh, she quickly becomes enamored of uh, Kenneth through uh, what other medium but football? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the most American ways of falling in love. <laughs> uh. She she falls for his thousand yard stare like he's still on the battlefield of Vietnam. Yeah, uh. that's that's the thing I always find the most attractive in people. Their <laughs> uh, their traumatized uh, distant look. <laughs> the two most American things. Football and Nathan Hale. <laughs> yeah, this scene is this scene is something. It, like like Ken, my dude. It, it it's good to have historic figures that you admire for what they did. And of course, she, their, her brother and them are older. They they were in the army, so there's an oh, age yeah, yeah, yeah. difference. That's why she's in college with them. 
Ah, mm. uh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It, it is one thing to have a historic figure that you uh, look up to. It is quite another to uh, reverently place your hands upon the bronze statue of this person and say, I can feel his heartbeat as our Actually, ideals align. Especially where uh, Ken decides to place his hand on the statue. Um, <laughs> on the shoe. <laughs> Little higher, well, yeah, Sam. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> No, you're right, you're right. Uh, paging through, his, his hand does uh, rise up from shoe towards the um, hip area. They both eventually settle on the chest. Not where the heart is, mind you, but, you know, <laughs> in the general area, I guess. As Patricia is also groping this statue and saying, "If I felt as if I was touching Kenneth's heart as she feels his heartbeat throbbing through the statue. Metaphors. Man. Pages I'm going to post out of context on the Twitter is <laughs> probably <laughs> this <the> one. <laughs> well, and then and then we get just the most like like romantic movie scene ever of them on the beach. And they like <laughs> w uh, when you touched the statue, what did it feel like? It felt like I could sense your heartbeat. <laughs> we shall be together <laughs> forever. <laughs> <Like it's laughs> I couldn't tell the difference between your heart and mine. It's it, it's so okay. sappy. Well, you want to know what's really sappy. They meet for coffee. It's now fall. Uh, Yamaoka is basically like, well, I'm graduated. I'm going to take a gap year. I'm going to study. Or I'm going to backpack across Europe. It's going to be that. And um, Patricia is just like, oh, yeah, that's normal rich boy things. That all makes sense. Where were you planning to go in Europe? Well, I was going to go here. Then I was going to go into Czechoslovakia. And then I was going to cross the Iron Curtain and... Um... <laughs> wait, wait, whoa, 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 you're going into the Eastern Bloc? Because, and you, hear, you hear me... They'll he, put you on a list. Hear me out. When I was in Vietnam, there were a bunch of guys the same age as me, and they really believed in this socialism thing to the point they were willing to die for it. I heard that socialism was its most pure in the Czech Republic... So when that rebellion was squashed, that was the most pure of it. And if that's the most concentrated, pure thing of this ideology, I should go check it out for myself. I shouldn't just believe things other people tell me about it. Right? Okay, while I appreciate your nuanced opinion, you know this is going to get you targeted by the FBI, right? Oh, screw it, I'm going with you. And then they, and then they uh, propose I, to each other. I, I know there was a bit of a pause there, dear listeners, but I want you to, I want you to imagine them staring very earnestly into each other's, into each other's eyes. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully you're recalling the thing that you already read, but... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good luck! <laughs> Eagle is out of print! Yeah, it's it, it, it's hard to find, but I got my copy. Time for business negotiations with Mr. Hampton and his his proboscis. No, that's not I, the right word. Proboscis? Protuberance. Protuberance. He, he's got a nose. Man's got a schnoz on him. Man's face is like 90% nose. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite something. But basically because they propose to each other, he uh, now has to do this in reverse and go ask the father's <laughs> for... permission. Well, and I mean, I, I, I will say this is once again, the most stock insert rich dad drama scene. And like, the thing is, who is it? It goes off the rails in typical Eagle fashion. It starts well, that way. The thing is like the, the fact that it's so stuck, because like the thing that resolves it is it going off the rails. But like mm. the, the structure of this entire sequence is you know, rich dad is concerned this guy won't do right by the family name, and then they have the heart to heart on the balcony alone. And I, and I blah, love blah, how blah. rich dad does every single thing, but mention that Yamaoka is Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> he, for all of his credit, does not bring that up. Yes, which I mean, it's one of those woods. It's like, well, that's a point in his favor in this story where I believe about. 15% of the things being said. <laughs> like, that's the thing. I don't know how much of this is just BS. This would be a weird thing to lie about, is the thing, like... Well, no, because it's Patricia creating an image for her husband. It, it doesn't portray his her family as very nice, is the thing. Like, it's... We only care about business. We are the bankers of bankers. Well, what dynasty is they, are they representing again? The Hamptons. Yeah, so... That's another aspect of, like, that culture that is just, it comes across, well, I mean, it is. 
it is what it is. I think one of the big things is that, especially how the conversation ends, because like, you know, like the whole thing that the rich dad has the biggest problem with is you don't have ambition. It's like, no, I'm going to be president. And like, that's where it goes off the rails. But also it does, it does uh, engrandize the noble ideals of the family too. I love his little villain uh, introduction as he's coming out after talking to his family before going out onto the veranda to talk to um, Kenneth. <laughs> he's got like the one glowing part of his glasses in his silhouette and then reveals him and he's just like, you have no ambitions. He's, then Yamaoka is just like, no, I am going to be president of this United States. Have you told any one of these dreams, boy? And he's just like, no. I have only come to this conclusion fully and have vocalized it with you. That's weird, because my son Charles said the same thing about you. <laughs> you were going to be president. And he was like, oh, me and Charles are life partners and best friends. He knows me better than I know myself. <laughs> okay, okay, do I make the three-way joke now or? We already made one joke about banging sisters. Two is too many. <laughs> <laughs> The big takeaway for me from this entire thing is that this of all the backstory flashbacks to me feels by far like the most artificial because the person telling it is the most artificial. <laughs> yeah, it feels like the script of a movie. My favorite panel is when the dad and uh, Yamaoka shake hands. They shake hands with such like ferocity. It claps and <laughs> <laughs> the sound of thunder. <laughs> And then they breeze over the most interesting part of the story, which is the two of them backpacked across the Soviet Union for a bit. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to worry about that. I love how that never really uh, gets elaborated on. Joe doesn't seem to care funnily enough. He doesn't press that. Yeah, I actually really like Joe's reaction to this because it seems like from the first page after the flashback that he's, you know, he's being drawn into the fiction again. He's like, wow, it's the flawless, ro it's flawless romance in the fullest sense of the word. No regrets for the past. It's perfect. And then we get uh, the heavy hand of symbolism as we have a picture of the happy uh, Hampton Yamaoka family as a jigsaw puzzle that shatters. Because there's a piece that's missing. The important thing is that this is a really nice story that fits together perfectly. But then, what's going on here? Because Takashi's mom has to fit into the story somewhere, and it seems like there are no gaps for her for that to happen. If uh, the thing about Yamoka being Joe's father is true, uh, his entire existence proves that that is not the case. So I think it's less of a matter of like, when did it happen? Because like the time period when it would have happened is not something that's been directly addressed. It's really more of here's this image that everyone I've talked to has has crafted and everything fits together perfectly, except for this one thing that I know about him. It's just it, though. It fits together so perfectly. It's like, where does this thing I know about him fit in? Like when, like, obviously the timeline of when it happened is, but like, if it did, it didn't seem to affect him at all. Because he was the person who starts uh, Patricia's story at the end of Elizabeth's. Mm -hmm. Like, that thousand-yard stare was from, well, I'm sorry, not from the end of Elizabeth's. It's the end from his story, which kind of combines with Elizabeth's so the same time period, roughly. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, as Joe is coming to the conclusion that this is a weird bag of worms, uh, he gets invited to a practice debate uh, with the mm -hmm. Yamaoka campaign because they got to prepare. They have to get ready for the actual debate. This is another fun series of interactions as Yamoka is taking questions from the uh, other debaters, big air quotes, as everyone else is playing up as being his opponents. You know, getting some uh, critiques from Tuck and, you know, here's how oh, you need to... Tuck is so good in the scene. I, yeah. I, I do love Tuck here. He's, he's just <laughs> playing man in the chair going like, okay, go. And my favorite part is the first guy. He's just like, okay, you're woodsman. And the guy proceeds to put on an unintelligible Southern accent. And I'm like, <laughs> ridiculous. You clearly are making fun of this guy not knowing how to speak. And then woodsman shows up in the debate and talks exactly like that. And I'm like, oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I met Same this person in person, if I met this individual in person, I'd probably assume they were having a stroke. Or like, episode. Like, <laughs> I say when these strict policies against the illegal drug traffic, why are we providing economic aid to countries that refuse to cooperate with the drug war? Like, 
the way this is structured in the panel is like whenever you're reading a manga and they're trying to do someone with a Kansai dialect, like they always like do that exaggerated Southern accent. And I'm like, are they doing it this way? And I'm like, wait, no, that doesn't make any sense. These people are localizing a Southern accent. Do they not know what Southern people sound like? <laughs> mm-hmm. I just love that it's cooperate. Paraphernalia. <laughs> I the way that got broken up in the speech bubble, I had to be like, "What the hell is he saying?" <laughs> <laughs> it took me a few times going over his dialogue. Yeah, uh, they love the hyphens for him. But anyway, everyone's given him some like good pointers. Uh, at one point, they bring up uh, education, and this is something that Yamaoka actually feels passionate about. So he gives like a very well informed answer, and Tuck shuts him up and is just like. You are not talking to Noah, who is a smart, educated individual. You are talking to the American public. Speak at a third grade level. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. <laughs> it, is, it is so painful how accurate that is. Strip the away the nuance that... that could actually solve problems and, and talk to people like they're idiots, because unfortunately, collectively, people usually are. Now, now the standard is eighth grade reading level, but in <laughs> my <laughs> experience... <laughs> It's it's uh, for newspaper for political debates. It's actually like I think it's fifth grade is what they aim for. Oh, wow. yeah. When I was because... working as a legislative correspondent, it was sixth grade. Yeah, it's because uh, TV mm. just requires someone be able to hear you, so you could potentially be speaking to illiterate people. Whereas mm. a newspaper, you assume a certain level of um, of literacy. Education. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. That does make sense. It's depressing, but it makes sense. <laughs> But anyway, uh, Takashi's being a sad boy, proceeds to interject into this like freeform dialogue with a very targeted question about uh, the importance of the family unit. And the entire, I, I thought he was just playing his part, like they had all been given pre things, but I think the implication is he just jumped in because we get multiple of the campaign staff going like, ooh, that's a good trick question. Good mm -hmm. job, reporter man! And meanwhile, he's just like, no, I'm gonna crush you. You're going to admit that you don't care about your biological children, because I need to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone thinks that this is in reference to Alex. Joe uh, presents the hypothetical as the moderator, saying, uh, I had to leave public office due to a family emergency. I had to be there for my child. I have to ask, Kenneth, uh, what would you have done in a similar situation? And Yamaoka looks Joe in the eye. He's a strange son and says, if I were ever faced with a family crisis serious enough to affect my work, I would leave public office to join them. <laughs> I gotta give it up for Joe for not flying to his feet and just going immediately for Yamaoka's throat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, and there is some Thankfully. tense moment as everyone is just like, ooh, yeah, what a good, like, line. Until it is broken by Yamaoka's uh, biological son laughing at him. <laughs> Alex just breaking down, cackling, like, yeah, okay, old man, whatever you say. Pray you never end up in that situation. And then, uh, as Alex wants to do, uh, he uh, runs off. Joe heads off to follow him. Well, it's even better than that, because he doesn't do that immediately. My favorite transition panel, though, is they're like, well, that was really tense. Let's move to something a little easier. Let's talk about gun control. And it just got <laughs> There, There are so many elements of this when, when this manga is on point. It hurts. It's so correct in some cases. But anyway. There is the televised debate. Uh, before the debate, we do have Joe finding uh, Alex at a bar. Uh, this is important for, I, I wouldn't have thought that this was important enough to mention if not for one particular panel uh, in our well, last chapter. Aren't they watching the debate in the bar is the thing? No, no, it's a news report about how the debate uh, is coming up okay. either the next day or the day after. Like, Because the, the news reporter is talking about how Yamaoka is going up in the polls. A drunk starts um, heckling. He's basically another Kennedy. He's someone who's got, like, rich money funding their campaign. Yeah. Mm. You want to be beholden to the banks? You want them running your life? Fooey, you shouldn't vote for Yamoka if you're against that idea. Joe does a good job of holding Alex back because Alex has the immediate reaction of like like he he immediately stands up at that. I think it's a really good character scene for Alex because um he doesn't say anything even as Joe is holding him back. And um thanks to Joe being there, he doesn't 
you know, throw a punch until uh, <laughs> Joe's the one who gets decked first. Yep, and then and then Alex lays the guy out, and they both run for it. Mm -hmm. Drinking at home is better. Let's do that instead. Because Alex isn't 21. He had a fake ID and was at the bar. Now yep. they're just going to go back to Alex has his own apartment in New York City where he has booze. Yes. So. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> The, I can oh, understand it's why this more like the atmosphere and everything. I mean, I can understand not wanting to drink at home and be sad all the time. I'm, I'm just saying, if you are the son of an aspiring politician, maybe publicly drinking underage when you could easily do so in your penthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that gets boring. I'll Wait, no, this was still the 90s. <laughs> I was trying to think, when did the drinking age increase? Well, and I mean, like, that's sort of the point. That's why everyone assumed that Joe was referring to Alex when he mentioned the, the family bit. Uh, one, of the, one of the really nice character moments for Alex, you get some pretty standard stuff. And it's very candid, and I really believe this. Like, you, you see Alex talking about a photograph of um, his father teaching him how to swim. And, you know, he talks about, like, we don't flash back to anything. So it feels, it feels more real and natural than, you know, the, the perfectly framed, like, flashback sequences. Because well, um, it sounds like he's actually has a positive memory of that day. He's like, yeah, that's when my old man taught me how to swim. But that's basically the last thing he ever taught me. Mm hmm Like, and like, even to the extent that, like, he he says almost exactly that, but he says it in such a way that um, it feels more like he does at a at a fundamental level understand why, like they no, have okay, the relationship the they do. Is. He's just not okay with it, and like he gets which is he, entirely fair. He gets that he's being a problem, but he can't really help it because you know he kind of needs a father figure in his life. And one of the things that I really liked uh, characterization wise is um, he says to Joe, I know why you held me back. You were concerned I was going to, you know, mention my father. And he says that I was totally going to punch that guy, but I wasn't going to say who I was. You know, mm. I'm not that stupid. And I really, you know, I, I believe that. I believe that he has the self-restraint to understand, like, you know, because of the conversation that he's having, he has the self-restraint to understand why that would be a problem mm -hmm. and um it really does a good job of characterizing the kind of person you know that he is deep well, down and I, he basically culminates the conversation with just like i just want like him to look at me like i'm a man not some liability to his campaign i want daddy to notice me at mm -hmm. which point takashi's like i also want daddy to notice me by the way we're secret brothers but i'm not going to tell you that but i'm deeply <laughs> thinking it tension is perfect i love the tension the narration boxes are are, are joe joe uh thinking <laughs> we have now bonded as siblings even though alex has absolutely no idea that's what just happened <laughs> <laughs> It is at once wholesome, interesting, and very, very funny. <laughs> we enter in the final chapter of our reading, the first half of the debate, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. just what it's labeled on the chapter title. So <laughs> that's how we know. <laughs> the debate. And this Wait. is when we get introduced to Woodsman, the person you cannot understand. <laughs> I agree with Nathan with the proliferation of drug abuse amongst the youth of this nation the future of our country's in jeopardy they spell our with a w and two r's our we got to save these kids of ours for it's too late and thankfully noah cuts him off and he doesn't get a lot of words in edgewise <laughs> yeah I i'm yeah. okay with that the the meat of the debate is that Noah is commanding the stage and Yamoka is only able to uh, respond to jabs. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of boxing metaphors thrown around because America. But Yamoka isn't really able to uh, get up there and uh, have his own views be uh, center stage. He's just responding to everything uh, Noah is saying. That panel that Jake mentioned of the drunk being important comes up as Rachel, uh, through uh, probably the extreme stress of lack of sleep and also driving through blizzards, is a little <laughs> under the weather. So I was about uh, to say, I got a completely different reading on this. I saw Rachel coughed slightly and Sarah jumped on it to go, oh, honey, no, you should go. You should go lie down. Yeah, yeah. I should send someone with you uh, to make sure you're... Hey, uh, Takashi, uh, why don't, why don't you 
take her home and go like make sure she gets in bed all right okay yeah 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 that. make sure she gets in make sure she gets in bed oh yeah good job Solid. sarah yes <laughs> it's very heavy honestly it's probably both <laughs> Uh, the melodrama got turned up from 11 to 12 because uh, as as Takashi is uh, taking Rachel home in a taxi, the a uh, sweet scene of her falling asleep on him, too. Mm-hmm. And that's immediately cut off by the red light. We see there's a black car looks into the side of the taxi, sees the two of them and proceeds to start following the car. And we get a cut to the drunk from the bar now in his car. Gonna just goes, got you now gonna teach you a lesson Mm -hmm. and then proceeds to use a racial slur for japanese people (laughs) wow i did not see that coming (laughs) which is amazing because Uh, i didn't know this guy knew who takashi was oh he doesn't he He only interacted with the other dude with alex yeah takashi didn't even do anything to you he was just there it's like that was enough yeah yeah, i guess i like it's not even like well, this given guy's... his language choice, I have a feeling that he might have targeted Takashi for a particular reason. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah the racial bias we were talking about. He also might have targeted Yamaoka for a particular reason. He just wasn't saying that in the bar, but like, <laughs> which is amazing given that he was drunk. Or not amazing given that he was drunk. You typically latch on to certain characteristics when you but were yeah, drunk. That... I'm, I'm saying it's amazing he wasn't more racist while drunk. Yes. But still, I was just blown away with the fact you're chasing these people in a publicly owned taxi. Look, I'm just saying, this man has the mustache of a racist. <laughs> <laughs> and the hairstyle of a divorced drunk. We only know the drunk part. We don't know the divorced part. I'm making assumptions, but you all <laughs> know I'm right. does not have a ring, so. Meanwhile, back at the debate. Noah has um, cornered uh, Yamaoka on a particular issue involving um, environmental protections and has gotten him to confirm, yes, you agree with all of us as Democrats. We all agree that this is very important, right? And he gets Yamaoka to give the standard like counterpunch. He's been doing the entire match. Like, yes, obviously I agree in that. And Noah's just like, well, then why as a junior senator did you vote against it? Why did you vote to abolish these environmental protections? So strange, particularly because while you were still an attorney, you uh, brought a class action lawsuit against these very same polluting companies. How swiftly your allegiances turn. And uh, Tuck is in a fury? (laughs) Tuck is so angry because he's just like, I can't believe he'd stoop so low. And I'm like, Tuck, you are literally the guy they went to because you fight dirtiest. <laughs> like, <laughs> Tuck, you are really... how did you get that speech in our last right, uh, reading section? <laughs> you are literally the pot calling the kettle black here, Tuck. Like, come <laughs> on, dude. Uh, but that is uh, the end of our reading. You, will, If you want to know how the rest of the debate goes, um, read the manga yourself or wait until next 4th of July. When Uncle Sam will come in his, I don't know, a Chrysler LeBaron? (laughs) (laughs) Uncle Sam, we've got three Sams on this show now. No, it's actually you. You need to wear the long stilts and the 4th of July hat. Okay. I I, I guess I've also assumed a Chrysler LeBaron is the most American car. (laughs) (laughs) I don't even know Uh, anymore. Oh boy, Sam is Legion, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) I am Legion for I am many. Uh, (laughs) But anyway, <laughs> as always, the eternal question, favorite character. Oh, man, I want to say Tuck because I, he was my favorite last time, but he didn't really get a lot of chance to shine in this particular section. So I'm going to give it up to uh, Mayor Blackburn. <laughs> what a force of a character to just show up, become this major, like, villain, <laughs> and then just get kind of handled like i i have zero doubt he'll show up later felt so self-contained of the deal of the negotiations with king blackburn that i'm like wow we really got this entire like super compelling like season of a political drama tv show out of this one character in like seven to eight manga chapters i respect that and I enjoyed this character. So, yep, I'm saying Mayor Blackburn. Uh, Jacob, how about you? Also, like, Mayor Blackburn a lot. It, it's a toss-up between him and, um, of all people, Alex. 
I really like the scene where he spoke candidly with Takashi uh, after the whole bar incident. I don't know. I mean, like to some extent, um, the especially the way he was talking in that moment, it felt like the first time that Takashi was talking to someone that was just completely real. Because I mean, like the the big thing is, it's like Rachel seems more like a fantasy, and then all of the people he talks about about Yamaoka all have th these things that. I mean, in all honesty, they're probably not all prepared, but it kind of feels like there are these all these prepared stories and just seeing seeing the uh, the depth of Alex's character and the fact that, like, you know, he he gets it. He's mature. He understands he's not getting the help he needs. You know, he needs a little bit more uh, attention from his positive attention from his family. But he also like like he also knows what the problem is and he's doing his best. And I, I appreciated that the sheer page count of Blackburn and how great of a character he is. I'd say he's a close second, especially because he's he also feels like a really deep character. But again, especially with the ending, it kind of feels like. We didn't really dig to the depths of the character, so to say. Because, like, it was, like, half of one chapter. You know, like, we had all the stuff from, like, the previous reading section. But, like, it was, like, half of one chapter, and it feels like we got so so much out of Alex. And I really mm. liked that for... I, I liked him a lot for that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Alex, but a very, very close second to Blackburn. All right. Uh, Jay, favorite character? Sure. Easy. Because he just gave me so much comedy gold. Um, with his outlandish <laughs> statement. <laughs> that That is very hard to argue against. <laughs> yes, so for very opposite reasons, not really deeper. Like, I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> That's, <laughs> fair. That's entirely fair. <laughs> and Matt, favorite character? I don't know, there's a lot of, the characters are so good in this, it's hard to pick just one. Mm-hmm. But uh, just to be a little different, uh, I really liked Rachel in this. I think mm -hmm. there is a lot of cool play with, I think she's a little bit more invested in the relationship than uh, Takashi is at the moment. They're both in that kind of like, what is this? But like also she's, she's clearly a little bit further along in it than he is because he's held back by knowing she's his sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'll That's put a fair thing to give that. someone pause. <laughs> Technically, they're not actually siblings, I don't think, because that's not actually how relations by marriage work. But that's why yeah. it's something that should give him pause. And it does. Yeah, but um, <laughs> this is a fraught situation. It, I just really liked the whole scene that played out where he said, hey, I really need to see you. And she's like, that's impossible. I couldn't possibly do that. And then proceeds to surprise him. She, he's late to the surprise. So she's like, well, this was all the time I had. I'm just going to head back now. Like, because we could have hung out for a two hours. Not to worry but... about it. You told him it wasn't happening. Well, I, here's the thing. You guys are all like, yeah, she was super pissed off about that. I think she was mostly just frustrated that they didn't get to spend time together. Oh, yeah. She, she's not what angry at him when she's leaving. She's just kind of in a huff because, like, yeah, I she's disappointed. Around. Yeah. And, like, so when he's just like, no, I'll drive back with you. You will spend time. And they have that cute scene of, that's why I'm a little bummed that my boy falls asleep within 10 minutes of being in the car. <laughs> <laughs> And then they pull over, they get that cute scene of waking up, and then they get that cute scene of them, um, like, in the cab together, up until the racist might involve in that, but we'll find out. Um, and, I don't know, uh, side character, Sarah, amazing, I love Sarah. Anyone who stirs the, like, relationship drama pot, mm, top tier. <laughs> Absolutely. That is an excellent... Sarah, Sarah has two personality traits, uh, push this relationship together, and say she had the hots for Yamaoka, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's pretty great any predictions for next year on thoughts on how this drama is developing <laughs> i suppose we'll find out next time on uh dragon ball z god i i don't really have any uh predictions my my one big thought it is it's more of a wish i cannot wait until joe just snaps and reveals the whole uh relationship the father-son relationship with yamaoka to the in obviously some way over the top fashion to the entire campaign uh staff at once and just watching that explode oh. i want him, i want him to yeet those reactive components together like a fat like a fastball all i want 
is him to misspeak while d saying so, and then have Rachel vomit at the realization. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> That's also a good one. One of the things for me that I noticed is um, because the easily the most believable flashback by far is Elizabeth's flashback. Granted, the part I am most suspicious about her backstory flashback is actually the thing to do with the stab wound. Because again, that feels that feels so much like a movie. <laughs> I know last time I was wondering if it was um, actually Joseph who was uh, Takashi's real father. Like, that was one of the theories that we had. Still possibly could be. It's still possible because, like, again, like, I trust most of what Elizabeth said. But again, it, the, the part that feels the most artificial from her perspective is when she flies out to, flies out to the Philippines and, you know, her brother, you know, his eyes open and like, you know, so it's like that that part of the story is um, but like, I don't know, because she's otherwise such a trustworthy character, I feel less confident in it now. I mean, to some extent, that's that's maybe a good thing, because if they do pull that, then it would be adequately surprising because they've they've done enough to obfuscate that without like it's still definitely possible. But that it is, but they they have set so much up about like Yamaoka having had the mom killed. Yeah, it's like they've for for the explanation to be you are really no threat because you are my brother's like illegitimate child. Like that that is such a non drama story from yeah. his brother that died in the war had a like bastard son with unless for some reason that makes him the true heir to the Hampton fortune like. I, yeah something like that yeah but yeah that had that had been my prevailing theory from where the story is going and uh it doesn't it doesn't feel that way anymore i i just want more tuck <laughs> I, I, I just want more tuck i want them to do some more dirty politicking i want noah to try something dirty so they've got to out dirty each other i guess uh we're at the end here so um Mm -hmm. As always, the final, I think we've all pretty much on the same board. This is so narrowly into each of our wheelhouses. Uh, <laughs> would you continue reading? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, maybe a surprise from me. So Jacob I... has a bad opinion. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. To some extent, I didn't feel that it was as unhinged this time. I don't know if the novelty has worn off for me a little bit. It was missing a lot of the wackiness that was in the first one. Like, we didn't have, this man has a stomach big enough to eat all 50 states. And we didn't have, like, political, t like, a lot of the jokes, too, were, like, from campaign advertisements. Mm -hmm. He and had, like, very, like, emotional drama in this one. It was well enough done. I didn't, I, it, you know, it's not like I'd ask for the time back. And I'm certainly not going to complain next year when it comes around. Like, after our first section, it was kind of hard for me to put it down to to stop at a reading point. Whereas this time, it didn't, like, enthrall me the way that the first time did. Jacob has bad opinions. Let's move on to Jay. Huh? I mean, I feel yeah. very much the same. Um, Jacob but, and Jay uh, have bad opinions. Moving on to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to caveat that with what that's why I'm motivated to read more. Because I feel like as it gets, as it heats up even more, and as Joe continues to push... Something's going to heat up and something's mm, going to explode. Yeah, it's going to be even more ridiculous hate jinx. Plus, I am Team Rachel Joe, and I need this to happen. I, I will <laughs> admit, we are on Volume 2. I very yep. much got, like, Volume 1 hooked you, and now you've got the build-up. This volume this was is, nothing but build-up. Yeah, this is a mm -hmm. downbeat. And and I recognize that, and that's why that's why I'm certainly looking forward to next 4th of July, but... I, I have to I have to, you know, speak my piece and it, yeah. it didn't grab me the way that it, it is. A, uh, it is a happened. it is a five volume omnibus of which we are on the second. I believe if you're going by typical story structure, the third should have like a big point. Then four rising action, five finale. All right. You just got Chamber of Secrets in. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you all once again for listening to the Over Manga Cast. As always, you can find us on all of your social media where we are at Over Manga Cast on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make sure to follow us for our premier high quality shit posting. And uh, also, as a, uh, you can use social media to uh, 
give us suggestions of what you want us to read. Uh, maybe you have a uh, holiday appropriate manga that you want us to check out. <laughs> I, we, I think we've only managed good ones so far, so if you want to give us a bad one uh, to complain about. I don't know, a, a crummy manga about the Easter Bunny or something? I don't know. <laughs> Matt's Monday. too good at finding finding really good holiday manga. I keep trying to find meme pics and they keep failing. But <laughs> if you guys want to help us out, uh, we would always appreciate reviews in any form. Uh, any of them are good. iTunes is kind of just how things are preferred so if you can do that we'd love some mm -hmm. uh yeah drop us a review and if you'd like to uh let us know about individual episodes in particular uh you can go ahead to the youtube channel uh leave comments in there we read all of them we respond to most of them and make sure to tune in next thursday where we are going to be reading a call of the night chapters one through 18 so make sure to uh, read that if you want to keep up with the show. And we'll see you all next week. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. I'm not going to sleep. Falling asleep is so lame. Only the real people stay out all night long. At 4 a.m., that's when the blood is tastiest. Fall asleep before 2 a.m. Don't even try it. Screw you all. I'm going to bed now. <laughs> <laughs>